one. Conrad Moffat Black, Baron Black of Cross Harbor, KCSG, born 25th of August, 1944, is a Canadian-born newspaper publisher, financier, and writer. He is the author of 10 books, mostly dealing with Canadian and American history, including biographies of Quebec Premier Maurice Duplessis and U.S. Presidents Franklin Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, and Donald Trump, as well as two memoirs. He's currently writing a political history of the ancient world, concentrating primarily on the Romans and the Greeks. His father was businessman George Montague Black II, who had significant holdings in Canadian manufacturing, retail, and media businesses through part ownership of the holding company Ravelston Corporation. In 1978, two years after their father's death, Conrad and his older brother Montague took majority control of Ravelston. Over the next seven years, they sold off most of their non-media holdings to focus on newspaper publishing. Black controlled Hollinger International, once the world's third largest English language newspaper empire, which published the Daily Telegraph in the UK, the Chicago Sun-Times, the Jerusalem Post, the National Post in Canada, and hundreds of community newspapers across North America, before controversy erupted over the sale of some of the company's assets. He is one of Canada's most recognizable and influential figures, and has known many of the great political actors and cultural figures of the last half century. It's my great pleasure to have him as a guest today. Thank you very much for agreeing to talk with me today. Uh, not at all, Jordan. Always a pleasure to speak with you. Yeah, well, it's very nice to see you again. It's been a couple of years since we've had the pleasure of speaking, and so I'm glad we have this opportunity, even though it's mediated by electronics. Yeah. Well, I, I've missed you. So let I want to talk to you biographically, essentially. I'd like to walk through your life. And so let's start as far back as we can. Tell, tell me about your childhood, if you would, and what stands out for you in relationship to your parents. And uh, well, well, I was born in Montreal. My parents moved here to Toronto when I was uh, very young, not even a year old. And... Um, just at the end of World War II, and and uh, we we lived in what was then just the edge of metropolitan Toronto. Beyond us were farms, and that was up uh, uh, for those of your um, viewers who know Toronto. Uh, uh, w w right after the Bayview Avenue passes uh, York University, uh, the Glendon campus, and the Granite Club uh, and Crescent School. Uh, just beyond that was where we lived, and that was the outer limit of the city uh, in, in terms of the built-up area. And uh, so there weren't many young people around, to, you know, to visit with in the neighborhood. So the result was that I spent more time, I think, it was the beginning of the television era. Everyone had a television set, but they just got it in the last few years, and there were only a few channels on the air. And for the most part, you had either those funny antennas sitting on top of the receiver or 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 a antenna on the roof of your house and um so i spent a lot of time reading and 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 that was how i developed my interest in history and i started reading about interesting historical personalities and my father although he was a successful businessman had been a a, a very um, uh, accomplished academic as far as he went but that was in the 30s and his father came under great financial pressure so my my father became a chartered accountant in the theory that there was as he put it no such thing as an unemployed chartered accountant and in those days people really had to think in terms of how could they how could they do things that made it as likely as possible that they would be able to make an income and provide, you know, and afford to get married and provide for families. Uh, and, and, you know, it was a much more financially pressurized era than it is now. And, and uh, that he, he uh, graduated in 1937 and we were starting as a society to recover from the depression by then, but uh, there were still huge numbers of unemployed and he had to set aside his academic interests. But with that said, he was a, he was a particularly, I was particularly fortunate in having him apart from anything else as, as a parent who encouraged that historical interest and knew rather a lot about many of the things that I 
uh, you know, that, that I took an interest in early on. And then as a, uh, a really a remarkable gesture, my parents took my brothers, just the two of us in the family, took my brother and myself to Britain in 1953 at the time of the coronation. And, and we, you know, we toured around all these monuments and was still, the war damage in London was still very evident then. So we, we saw what the war was like from much closer than anyone experienced it in North America. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I remembered as, as very young people do remember, uh, you know, visiting uh, the Duke of Wellington's house and St. Paul's Cathedral and things like this. And uh, so I always had an interest in history and was encouraged uh, by my parents, my father in particular. And, and uh, that was, that was a, that, I think that was the only thing that was particularly, if not exactly noteworthy, a bit different from most of the people I went to school with because they lived closer into town and had more social time. Uh, than I did. So you speak of your father fondly by the sounds of it. It sounds to me like he was an encouraging figure in your life from a very young age. Is that a reasonable presumption? Yes. I, no, I, I remember both my parents very fondly. My father, uh, and this is an area I wouldn't want to, for obvious reasons, get into too much, but uh, later on, he became at times a slightly depressive personality. And, and his career was something of an anticlimax. He, he did very well and, and made a significant amount of money. And he, had, uh, he, he was working with, I mean, with slash for a uh, very famous uh, Canadian industrialist, E.P. Taylor, and in the brewing business. And he was the chief executive of what was then the largest, uh, well, one of the largest brewing companies in the world, but certainly the largest in Canada. It was called Canadian Breweries Limited in those days. And um, uh, he had a disagreement on policy with Mr. Taylor. And he said, look, instead of, um, instead of having an argument about this, I, I do, I've done this job now for 10 years and I, and I, I don't need the salary. I'm, you know, my, I don't need it to live in the way I've become accustomed to. So I will retire now. It's probably time for change after 10 years. You do whatever you want with the company and we remain friends and don't strain our relations. And that's what happened. And they remain friends uh, to, the, to the end of his life. Um, and, uh, but so he, 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 he retired at the age of 47 and uh, he was a well-to-do man. He, he didn't lack for anything in the material way, but the balance of his life, nearly 20 years, was an anticlimax. He just sat in his house and read and saw a steadily, slowly but steadily declining number of people. And, uh, and he just never did anything particularly after that. I don't mean that he should have charged out and got a job, but that's not for me to say and wouldn't, wouldn't have served any purpose anyway, unless he was particularly enthused about it. But someone like, it, it's a, I found it's a perfectly good thing and often a very uh, renovating thing to change careers but but uh, and I'm sure you would in your experience know this and believe the same thing it, it is a bad thing to simply do nothing just sit in a rocking chair uh, that that leads to a, a steady and accelerated level of decline and that unfortunately is what happened to my father I mean he, he was 65 when he died but but uh uh, which, which is not really a good lottery ticket nowadays, but, um, but it was an anticlimax. But, mm -hmm. but he, he always was an interesting man. I would, even, even after I, you know, I, I left, I moved out of the house to go to university when I was, uh, uh, gee, I was only 18. And apart from that, apart from one year, I, I didn't live with my parents again. But uh, I was in Toronto m m much of the time, and and I always saw them a lot, um, and 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 it was always interesting. Always had a good relationship. I had a somewhat turbulent period in my teens, and looking back on it, uh, I can see that my parents treated me with uh, greater patience than, than probably I would if I were in their position. And uh, but I, I I believe that uh, you know that was just a phase in our last. Uh, the last five years, they, my parents died only only ten days apart, and um, uh, the, our last ten years or so couldn't have been more cordial. Yeah, you know, well, I was curious about your father because 
I'm, I'm, I'm curious psychologically about the role that fathers in particular play in relationship to encouraging their children, which seems to me a primary paternal role. And so when, when I see someone who's successful and, 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 and who, who I, I suspect in some sense isn't intrinsically rebellious in their central spirit, maybe that's wrong. I'm always curious about their relationship with their father. I mean, you started to read early, you were reading history. He obviously, did he, did he push books your way? Did he guide your reading? How did that all? Yeah, sometimes, uh, he, he I'm, in particular, he gave me when I was 13, he, he handed me a book and he said, obviously, it's not for me to tell you what to read, uh, but I do recommend this. And if you just read a few pages in it, I, I think you will want to continue. And it was A.G. McDonald's book, Napoleon and His Marshals. To people interested in Napoleon, it's a very famous book. And for example, one of the great tomes on Napoleon, David Chandler's The Campaigns of Napoleon, a book of 1300 pages of tremendous work of scholarship and very well written in the in the forward credits A.G. McDonald and, and and people who write about Napoleon often do it's a tremendously readable book and 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 and, and it, it gave me a, a, a huge interest in Napoleon that I've that I've kept up you know I mean after a while you you feel you know enough about somebody but but uh but it it, it was a great um uh, it was a great uh, uh, encouragement and incitement and, and confirmation of the intrinsic interest in studying these very interesting personalities of, of the past. And he did a number of things like that and in slightly different fields. Another one, some years later, uh, two or three years later, he, he gave me a, a copy of um, uh, Nancy Mitford's Pursuit of Love. Now, it's a novel, but about real people but the names changed and um and it, it was a, a particular satisfaction to me in in later years when i was living in britain and was the chairman of the daily telegraph and i met a lot of these people my nancy mitford unfortunately had died but uh, her sisters the duchess of devonshire i knew and the uh, uh, lady mosley the widow of sir oswald mosley the fascist leader i i, I met her and Jessica Mitford, who was married to a communist, was a very eccentric British family, uh, uh, so a wide gap in their political views. And um, uh, Nancy Mitford herself was, had a tremendous uh, torrid romance with one of the most prominent figures in the entourage of General de Gaulle, and uh, when he was the president of the Fifth Republic, and and uh, and, and prior to that. And um, uh, so, so these books, I just cite those two in particular, but uh, they were tremendously readable, interesting books, and, and they did launch my interest in different fields. He, he did that a number of times, but he was never oppressive or, or, or uh, dogmatic about it, and actually quite subtle. I remember um, my parents took us on Easter holiday in 1955, so I was 10 years old, my brother's four years older out to the west coast by train and back but but we got around a bit on the west coast and um on the train my father gave us a reward if we would memorize lincoln's address at gettysburg now it's only 10 sentences you know it's not that hard to memorize it and we did but but it did incite my interest in mr lincoln and of course he's a, one of the great and arresting figures of modern history as well so yes he did that i i, I there you, you put me in mind of these and i no doubt if, if this was the chief focal point of our discussion i could identify a good many other things but i i cite i cite those ones and, and how, by the how way on, you... on the nancy mitford piece i, I yep. a, 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 a house that is referred to in um a pursuit of love is one that they love to go to because unlike their own house it wasn't drafty it wasn't that eccentric british rural nobility's terribly uncomfortable house without real hot water and 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 then that kind of thing it was just a very comfortable house with central heating and so on and it turned out that a friend of mine rented it and we went out there to lunch a few times and it, it, it was it, i mean i I couldn't explain it in a way that would be of any interest to anyone that was there other than my wife, but it was, it was as if I'd been there before from having read about it. It was just a very interesting connection with my past. 
How old were you when you started to read seriously? Uh, I I started it when I was nine or ten. I, I remember reading. Um, I remember reading the first volume of General de Gaulle's War Memoirs when they were first published in English. They're the ones that begin all my life. I've thought of France in a certain way. And uh, it's beautifully written, by the way. I mean, de Gaulle was a wonderful writer. He's not always historically reliable, but political memoirists rarely are. I mean, the same could be said of Mr. Churchill, but he, he, he is a lovely writer. And, uh, um, uh, and so from then on, I, 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 was, I, I wasn't writing. I mean, for a while I read the boys book of the Navy. And I, I think, I think I, we went through the Hardy boys and that kind of thing for, you know, approximately one month when I was seven or eight, but I moved on to the history of the Navy or some sports figures, you know, like Ted Williams or something like that. And then I got into, I got into the history thing when I was nine and stayed at it after that. So how much, how much were you reading when you were a kid, say nine to Well, 15? I wasn't a fast reader, but I was, a, I was a retentive reader. So when I read something, I tended to remember it well. And uh, you know, a couple of hours a day, every day, you know, and, and then a little more on the weekends. When would you do that before you went to bed? Did you have a routine? Yes. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I know. I'd have, you know, I was supposed to do my homework. And there were some television programs I, I watched that I liked. But uh, yeah, I, I wasn't one of these young people who was, who was just stuck glued in front of a screen every every free moment the way a lot of youngsters nowadays are with the video games and things i i wasn't like that i mean it is possible and i look jordan as you and i know there are hundreds of millions of people in the world who do sit staring at a television set all day but i i, I and and they're always you know, as long as we've had television there have been people who've been thoroughly captivated by it but i was always rather more choosy in programming i i mean i like uh Inter things like war, uh, victory at sea, you know, it's a drama about the U.S. Navy. Uh, yeah, that or, was a great or, series. I know that series. It's, it's a great yeah, and, series. Yeah, and with Richard Rogers' music, which really taken from Wagner, but powerful beginning, and showing the, uh, the, you know, the aerial shots of the Pacific Fleet, these, this colossal Navy moving forward. But, um, uh, and some of the humorous programs, like The Honeymooners with Jackie Gleason, I like. But, but I, I would... I would know a program to watch and go and watch it for half an hour and then go back and read something. I wouldn't just sit there waiting for whatever came next. And were you up all night with, with flashlight under the covers reading? Not all night, uh, but uh, often a little bit. And, and it has to be said that my parents were not overly um, authoritarian. It was a relatively large house. And I could, my mother would come up once in the course of the night and make sure everything was fine. But I, 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 I uh, I, I normally hear her coming, but in any case, they didn't get particularly excited about about my reading with a flashlight because they correctly assumed that a nine or ten or eleven year old would fall asleep anyway. So, you know, when he felt like it. So, any idea what it is about history in particular that attracted you? Because obviously, you you have an intrinsic interest in it. You didn't even gravitate towards fiction when you were a child. You you gravitated towards nonfiction and history pretty fast. So, what this is, is it? What is now, it about I, history? I must say, I I went on a binge of fiction in university uh and uh, when i started it, it, as, as one does you know i mean i find i found that with my own uh, uh sons and daughter and and uh you, you know you you you, you, so you suddenly become interested in writing and you read a lot that he wrote and then you're on to a next one you know so in that way uh you know i i read a, a huge number of novels by famous novelists and is that is that what you did? You'd find a novelist you really liked, and then read everything, and then move on to to someone yeah, else. Basically, yeah, and especially the Americans, you know, Scott Fitzgerald, and Ernest Hemingway, and John Steinbeck, and so on, uh, and uh, and the latter two were were alive. And I was reading about them, reading their works, and um, uh, but but uh, but I got into others, but not as comprehensively. I mean, I think I read four or five of the books of. Uh, uh, George Eliot and uh, uh, most well, you know, a number of uh, Thackeray and um, uh, you know the obvious ones. You know, mm -hmm. that, yeah. mm -hmm. And so, what what was it about history? Do you think that that attracted you so much and so young? Um, because 
many, I mean, the personalities I was reading about were terribly interesting. They had extraordinary careers. And it, and it, it started to give me, and this sounds ludicrous, you're, 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 you, you may, you and your viewers may conclude that I'm a psychiatric case or something, but it's not as if I identified at all with, say, a man like Napoleon. It's just that in his career, you could see points where absolutely everything was at risk and he persevered successfully and points where he he he, he was you know fortune had not smiled upon him and and it, it things looked terribly bleak and then suddenly things opened up now it was a revolutionary time unlike canada in the 50s and 60s i mean you could scarcely think of a more, less revolutionary place and and um uh it, it, but the, the, the pattern of events where people's fortunes change so quickly and in both directions. I mean, of course, Napoleon ended up in St. Helena, but, uh, but um, he, he actually attempted to commit suicide after he came back from Russia. And, um, uh, and, and it, 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 we were referring earlier to Abraham Lincoln and there were, there were moments where everything appeared to be terribly gloomy he appeared to be a failure was was widely mocked for a variety of reasons including his physical appearance which which in photographs is actually rather impressive but um uh, uh, but it, it appeared to be hopeless and that he was consigned to being a a failure who had who had tried to prevent the breakup of this country unsuccessfully and had propagated a war that was not successful and and of course it all turned, and 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 you 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 end up appreciating the qualities of these people, both those to emulate and those to try to avoid. Now, in Mr. Lincoln's case, it's a particularly striking example because it, it is almost impossible to find something negative to say about him. He was a self-made man, but with none of that chippiness that self-made people often have. He was a, a genuine intellectual but an autodidact and and uh, but never with any of the pomposity or dogmatism of some intellectuals and and he 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 was always saddened rather than angry at the many betrayals and disappointments that he suffered and while he was a rather morose man in some ways he had a splendid sense of humor he had a terribly difficult wife and had two sons die as boys, and and this tragedy did not these tragedies and afflictions didn't didn't compromise his ultimate sense of optimism, and uh, uh, he, he was uh, he was really a, a remarkably admirable character as well as an extremely effective statesman. And of course, he 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 was a wonderful wordsmith. Uh, I mean, you we were talking about the Gettysburg Address. I noticed when I first read it under the incitement to memorize it, that, <clears throat> for example, where he said, uh, um, fondly, well, I, I, you know, he said, um, for those who here, here gave their lives that that nation might live. I mean, just to use the same word as the noun and the verb in the same sentence is slightly artistic, you know? And in the second inaugural, when he said, uh, Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray mm -hmm. that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. I mean, that, that is, in fact, a line of poetry. Mm -hmm. he, he, he was a, a, a remarkable wordsmith. Mm -hmm. And you were, you were noticing that the way that words were crafted as well when you were reading history? Uh, not, not as well as one does after a bit of practice, but you know, you, I started to notice and then started to look for it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and all right. So you were reading well in advance, well in advance of your years. What was it like for you going to school when you were, let's, let's go when you were a child again, before you went to university? What well, do you from... I, I, I was, you know, I, you always did the necessary to, to be um, on the same wavelength, if you will, as your friends. You know, I didn't want to be thought of as a, as a, I didn't mind being thought of as slightly eccentric. I didn't want to be thought of as an odd person. You know? and, and in fairness, as, as, as a, lot of, a lot of the other students were interested in a lot of things. I, I went to relatively, I guess, relatively um, 
good schools. I mean, I didn't like them very much, but, uh, but I loved university, but I didn't like school very much. But, um, uh, it, it's, and, and I remember you know, in 1958, I was 13, and because it was well known that, that I was interested in France when the disturbances came in the spring of that year, at the end of the Fourth Republic, the, uh, our class teacher asked me if I would, because this was, this was on the front pages of the newspapers and led the news every night, you know, the return of de Gaulle from Colombe in 58, um, and the threat of the revolt by the army in Algeria. And the teacher asked me if I would give a five minute comment on it the following day, so I did. And, and I'm, I'm, you know, I was careful to try and not be pompous or, and, and not get into obscure things. And, and I don't mean to put on the airs of somebody who was any, in fact, great authority in these matters, but um, I, 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 was, I was flattered that he asked and I, and I made an effort to try and make it interesting. And, and it was appreciated. And I, I, it, was, it was one of those little experiences in life that was very positive and reassuring to me that these, the, my classmates didn't think I was just a kook, you know? And because they were reading about it too, and they were in a way saying, "Well, you know, what's going on in France?" I mean, in in, in Canada and Britain and the United States, you, you know, you didn't have the army threatening to return to the capital by parachute and take over the country, and, and everybody going out into the country uh, 120 miles to talk to a retired general about whether he wanted to take over the government or not. I mean, the, 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 yeah, we, we didn't have that in the speaking country, so it was a bit different. Do you remember anything of your ambitions at that time? Well, here, I must say, I was somewhat influenced by my father's milieu. Uh, Toronto in those days was, if I may say it without, I hope, sounding like an old dowager or something, a terribly plain, austere place. It, it, there wasn't any flair to it. It, it had nice residential areas, but but it wasn't a good looking city at all. You know, there, uh, until the first subway was opened in the mid fifties, uh, all the wires were above ground. So you had these creosote soaked, um, blackened uh, telephone poles everywhere, weighted down with thick clusters of wires. And a, a, an inordinate amount of that old sort of Victorian reddish but not red brick or the color of Queen's Park but with you know with the dust of years on it apart from a few individual buildings like the um, old Bank of Commerce for example and Osgoode Hall uh, and some others there weren't many nice looking buildings downtown it was not a nice looking city the way Montreal was or let alone uh, New York or something and um uh, and and there, there, you know, it was a, a virtuous place, but it was a terribly sober place. You know, you couldn't go to the cinema on Sundays. There wasn't a Sunday newspaper. Now, I, of course, was just a boy and I didn't drink or anything. But if, if, if older people, um, I mean, if your cousins of mine who were older, for something, they wanted to go out with a date. They had to go to a to a hotel to find a restaurant that was licensed. I mean, it, it was that only changed with John Roberts in the 60s. And um, uh, so it, it, my father's friends, businessmen, as far as I could see, were, were the only people that had any sort of style, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Taylor and Mr. McDougald and Colonel Phillips, who was the chancellor of the university. Uh, that, that he was associated with them and, and others who were friends of his, like John Bast and so on. They, they had some style, they had some flair, and they were wealthy, but but in a tasteful way. And they had, you know, they, it, 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 so I, that it was kind of an attractive thing to aspire to be wealthy and and and, and enjoy it, but in a tasteful way. You see, I mean, Mr. Taylor built the jockey club it was just a bunch of milk wagon horses and fixed races until he took it took it over and fixed it up and you know made it a great horse racing operation and um so i so i was sort of attracted to the idea of getting into business in a way that i could uh, i could raise my uh, you know raise my net worth and standard of living but but all all was uh, i i had a, a if not exactly an academic interest certainly a 
an interest to study history and potentially to write some. Although, although it took me a long time to summon the courage to write any. Yeah, so you've covered your interest in history, and now we've delved into a little bit into the origins of your interest in business. So that does leave that third issue hanging to some degree. So let's go to the, to the time when you went to university. You, you, you said you read a tremendous amount of fiction in university. What did you major in, and, and what was it like for you? How do you remember your university experience? Uh, very fondly. Uh, I went first to Ottawa. Pardon me, to the to Carleton University, and um, I had a, a somewhat um, rumbustious career in high school, and changed schools a number of times. And finally, I came. If if I may just back up slightly, so if, if if anyone is interested in my story, this is an interesting part of it. I, I it's not for me to say whether it is in the abstract interesting or not. But um, uh, I, I, in grade thirteen. I finally concluded that th these schools were so incompetent, and most of the teachers in them were so incompetent, and in addition, malicious, some of them, that I discovered that you could, in fact, write your matriculation examinations on your own. You didn't have to do it in a school. So I informed my father that this is what I was going to do in, in, in February of my last year in high school except that in those days you had nine examinations and you had to pass them all or you didn't matriculate. So, it, you know, it, it, I was really taking a, a, a leap here, but, uh, and the, the examinations were written in the old armory on University Avenue where the, where just immediately to the west of Osgoode Hall. It's now a Supreme Court building, <coughs> but there was an armory there. And several hundred of us of all ages, mainly older people, came in each day, put down $5, and we could write the examination. And I, I worked like a beaver to prepare for those examinations, and I passed them all. And if you'll pardon me, of quite a personal recollection, uh, the way my father's house worked, he stayed up late. This is a habit I got from him. He stayed up late, and he slept in. I mean, he, he got a lot done in a day, but he, he, he was operating on a slightly different clock than most people. Well, in those days, the post office delivered the mail to the house at about 8.30 in the morning. And on one particular day in the spring of 1962, my mother got it and she saw this letter from the Ministry of Education addressed to me. So she surmised it might be my results. So she brought it to me. I opened it and I said, well, it was a scrape. I had a 50 and a 51, but I passed everything and I have matriculated and I'm eligible for the university, though I won't get into McGill or Toronto, which is what I wanted, but I'll get into one of them. So she disappeared and something that was unheard of in our house at, at about 10 minutes to nine in the morning, I heard the unmistakable footfall of my father in his dressing gown, as it turned out. He said, I congratulate you, extended his hand, I shook hands with him, and he went back to bed. Now, it sounds absurd, but it was a very moving experience. When he congratulated me, I said, well, you know, you've been more than intelligent, and I thank you for that. He said, it's fine, you know, congratulations. It, it was, it, 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 that means a lot. And what do, you, what, do you, what do you think motivated him to congratulate you at that point? And why do you think it meant so much to you? I had great, we had our differences in those days, not, not in later years, but we, you know, as one does, you know, one does have differences with parents sometimes. And, um, but I, I, he was a very, very intelligent man and, 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 a, and a good man. And I had great respect and admiration for him and for him to congratulate me in a way that wasn't perfunctory. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, well done if you, you know, won a hand at cards or something. It, 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 the, the way he said it, he imparted a seriousness to it that made it clear to me that he thought that what I had done was a major achievement. And the fact that he thought it was not only confirmed my view that it was, in fact, something of an achievement, but the fact that he thought it was a major achievement coming from a very successful and intelligent man, which he was, and who was, after all, the principal male figure in my life, uh, it, 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 was, it was a milestone. For me. And what do you think made that accomplishment particularly worthy of both memory and note? 
What did it do for you? Now, you have alluded look, to the fact way, that you were causing some trouble in, in high school. Yeah, yeah. look, in a way, it legitimized the comparative hell-raising of my late high school years. It, it sort of wiped the slate clean. The score at the end of the game is you win, you see? You right. graduated. So you, you weren't just it. a rebel without a cause. <laughs> yeah, well, I maybe didn't have a cause, but at least the rebellion ended with me still in one piece and, and, and in defensible shape morally, if you will. I mean, in terms of the, uh, the, my ability to defend my conduct as a whole, not every part of it. Right, right. Yeah. So you, you I mean, for all chat? the nonsense and, and the you know, foolishness that, and I, I had my full share of it for people that age, it ended well. And it was, look, it, it, I, it's, I, it embarrasses me to say this, and particularly at this remove in time, but it actually was simply an achievement for somebody who hadn't been in the habit of really concentrating that much on schoolwork to buckle down, study all of these things. Uh, and, and 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 I had some I had some good scores. I mean, my overall average was was not bad. And and to to, to do it all and pass it all the way I did was uh, it, it was an achievement. Right. Well, it sounds like that's when you learned to actually do some academic work. That's right. I think I think that is I think that is absolutely correct. Right, and that's a good good preparation for university because. You do a lot better at university if you can work on your own. I mean, when yeah, I went to university, especially when you when you're getting close to the exams, and you have to really swat it up, you know. Yes, yes. I, I mean, I didn't work in high school, and I learned to work in university, and there was a big difference, and it was very much worthwhile learning to work. And okay, so you yeah. went off to university, and you have I have specific reasons to ask you about university. I've had discussions with a number of people recently about their university memories. Some young people. Um, including Yeonmi Park, who is a refugee or an escapee from North Korea, who just spent mm-hmm. four years at Columbia in New York, which was a dream of hers, and described it to me as a complete waste of time and money. And when I pushed her on that, insisted that she didn't have one course or one professor worthy of note, which was terribly shocking to me. And then I followed that up with Rex Murphy, who went to Memorial University in the 1950s and late 1950s and had nothing but positive things to say about his experience. So and for me, when I went to, I went to a small college to begin with, but I had a excellent professors there. They taught me, they were admirable people. They paid a lot of attention to me and to my friends. I learned to write, I learned to work. I learned, well, I learned, I learned how to buckle down and, and, and be serious about my academic pursuits. So for me, it, all the memories, almost all the memories of certainly my early university education and my graduate education for that matter were positive. So, but things may have changed since then, but, your experience. Yeah, I, I imagine that young lady, I, I, from all I hear, the, most of these well-known American universities have just gone to pieces, but, I, but I, maybe, the, maybe the graduate departments are better, I don't know. But uh, I imagine she at least enjoyed living in New York City. She'd learned something from that. Anyway, it's such a vital city. Uh, uh, but the, um, uh, you, you actually set this up for me very nicely and put me in mind of a couple of things. Uh, as an undergraduate, uh, the uh, I did encounter a professor who, who, who did have a very profound impact on my ability to focus on things and, uh, and, my, and my interest in certain subjects. Uh, you may even know her for, for all I know, uh, Naomi Griffiths. She would now be in her early 80s, I think, but uh, um, she, she's a specialist in Acadian studies. She was very friendly with the late Governor General Romeo LeBlanc. But um, she was a very fine lecturer and, and also a very kindly and sociable person. And, and I got to know her a little bit. Uh, and and, uh, and she, she, she did help focus me in certain um, historic areas. But what, what happened uh, after I graduated from Carleton was we were, that, that was in 1965, and we were, we were getting into um, they sort of run up to the centennial and the, uh, especially in Ottawa, there was a great emphasis on, uh, uh, on, um, you know, the biculturalism and, and the, it, it was clear that things were starting to really, uh, simmer in unpredictable ways in Quebec, unpredictable politically. And, uh, it was in the autumn of that year that in, in the guise of seeking a majority, um, 
Mr. Pearson and his advisors, some of whom I got to know quite well subsequently, uh, called an election and their real motive was to bring in some strong Federalists from Quebec. Uh, they had never really replaced Mr. Saint-Laurent as the federal leader in Quebec. And, um, and uh, that was when Pierre Trudeau and Jean Marchand, Gérard Pelletier and others came in and, and uh, they, they were starting to sort of pivot to meet the, this challenge to federalism from Quebec. And uh, one thing led to another and um, because I, I was unsure what I wanted to do, I, for a year I operated, I bought for practically nothing because it wasn't worth anything from a good friend of mine, uh, who, uh, who, Peter White, who uh, had lived as my sub tenant in my place in Ottawa my last year when he was working with Maurice Sauvé, the, subsequently the consul to the governor general, but he was then a junior minister in Mr. Pearson's government, um, but the first of that avant-garde from the sort of new Quebec to say, and, and he owned a little newspaper in the Eastern Townships, about 60 miles east of Montreal and um, in, in Knowlton, Quebec. And I bought a half interest in that for $500, which is $499 more than it was worth commercially. But uh, that's what I did for a while. And, and it, 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 and that I was while you, why, while you were a student? Uh, you know, it was, it was after I finished as an undergraduate and before oh, okay. I went on to, uh, to my next university. And, and so what happened was that infected me with interest in the newspaper business. I'd always had some because I was interested in the, again, the style of some of these famous newspaper owners, you know, uh, like William Randolph Hearst, for example, the most obvious example, or Colonel McCormick on the Chicago Tribune. Uh, uh, and and uh, up to a point, some of the British press owners, Lord Beaverbrook, who was alive then, and uh, uh, Lord Northcliffe and some others. And, um, uh, but obviously sitting out in Eastern Townships producing an eight page half tabloid was a long way from living in San Clemente, you know, Mr. Hearst's famous house in California. But uh, the, um, it also infected me with the an interest in in Quebec in French Quebec, and um, even though it was an English paper, you know, we, we the you know obviously one was in a largely French milieu. So the upshot of that was that the next year, I became a law student at Laval University, French University in Quebec City, and um, and that was a terribly interesting and positive experience. I have to say, even though we were I think only 15 uh, English speaking law, I mean, primarily English speaking law students in a faculty of uh, I don't know, 500 or so. Um, and in the graduate arts building where we were, a tall building, we were, there, could, uh, there were thousands of students coming and going and we, we, there couldn't have been more than 50 of us who weren't basically French speaking and in many cases, exclusively French speaking. And, um, and, and it was an entirely positive experience. Uh, there, there, there was no, absolutely no ethnic antagonism. I mean, people got on well or they didn't, but not for ethnic reasons. And I have to say those people, all of them, could not have been more welcoming and pleasant as a group. And I've always okay, so had a bias I have three in questions. favor. Yes. Three questions to come out of that is, um, what did your undergraduate career do for you why were you motivated to buy this newspaper? And why did you go to a French-speaking university for law school? Ah, well, the, the, my undergraduate career was the point at which I turned from being largely a social uh, operative, effectively studying, as uh, frankly, Jordan, I think most young men do as undergraduates, studying chiefly uh, female anatomy and the contents of uh, uh, the containers of alcoholic beverages, and and I was more successful at the second than the first. But 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 one got on, you know, and then you did you studied as much as you needed to. Well, uh, Naomi Griffiths helped motivate me to treat it as a little more than something where you just pass the years and check the box of going from first to second to graduating year. What, what did start, she do to do that? 
she she gave me the vision of actually becoming an authority on some part of history and also writing about history then then um so that would be my main answer to your first question. Now, your 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 last one was was why a French university. But your second one was why I bought the newspaper. I think yes. I, I, I was at loose ends, you say. So I and and so it, frankly, my friend Peter White said, "Look here, I, I need an editor of this paper. I mean, I'm here in Ottawa, and and uh, and then at the end of it, the government changed in Quebec." And the Union Nationale won, Duplessis old party won with Mr. Johnson, Daniel Johnson Sr. And he hired Peter White as his chief English language assistant. He was head of the English language section of the Premier of Quebec's office, which is a serious position. In the, in the English community of Quebec, that is, a, that is an important position. And, and he conducted it extremely well. And Mr. Johnson was, was, a, was a very impressive man, I thought, and still think. But um, he said, I look, I got to have an editor for this paper. Or I'm going to have to close the paper. Why don't you buy it a half interest for nominal sum and be the resident editor for a while until you decide what to do? And, and, and then one thing led to another. And he was an alumnus of the law faculty of Laval. And, and a number of famous English Canadians were most famously Brian Mulroney. He was, he was in Peter's class. I mean, they're older than I am. They're but five or six years older than that. And um, Michael Meehan's another, who's a senator. He's now, I think, the chancellor of McGill University. His grandfather was the prime minister and, um, and others. And, and so once I got into that milieu, uh, I, because of who I knew, I, I, I got a little bit into the edges of Quebec politics. And I met Premier Johnson and, and our paper served the English residents of the vice premier. Quebec and the subsequent premier, Jean-Jacques Bertrand. So I, I got the, I don't mean no in the sense that it was anything other than, you know, bonjour or something, but, uh, but I got to sort of into the, to the edge of that. And, it, and that period coming up to 1967 with the fermentation in Quebec, which was uh, very active politically, but not, nothing violent about it at that point. Um, uh, it, it, it was an exciting atmosphere. And, uh, and, then, and and you also said that you had become aware of newspaper owners approximately at this point. And, and so, well, well it, it, just the way they lived, it was, I, I mean, I, look, I'd never have aspired to live in the, in the oriental monarchical faction, fashion of William Randolph first I mean, made most famous and caricatured in uh, Citizen Kane. Uh, you know, which Orson Welles officially denied it had anything to do with Hearst, but as Time magazine put it, lawyers for Mr. William Randolph Hearst have determined otherwise and have prosecuted accordingly. But the, um, uh, the, uh, it, it, it developed along that way. So I, I, I became motivated academically, then ha had a reason to move to Quebec and get involved in this most modest scale. You can be short of just being a newspaper delivery boy, but in a position where I did everything. I was the publisher and the editor. I, mean, I had an assistant who did the actual clerical work, but you know, I sold the ads. I produced the circulation campaigns such as they were, and I wrote most of the content. So as you know, that's so the how way much to were you writing? But do it all, you see. Right, and, right. Yeah, and then and then and then I thought it would be a good idea to, to pursue my studies in Quebec, in a French university, and, and uh, Peter White helped me. And, and uh, indeed, um, the premier allowed his name to stand as, as, as a recommendation. Now, in, in Quebec City in 1966, if someone appeals for it or applies for entry to the law faculty and, and one of the sponsors is the prime minister of Quebec, I mean, and, and, unless it's a joke and this guy has never got past grade seven, he's going to be admitted. And 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 um, uh, and and it was a, an entirely positive experience. But it, it, you must understand, it was a double and ultimately a triple experience. If I may elaborate, I really had to learn the language. I knew it, mm -hmm. the kind of basic French a high school graduate in Ontario knows, where I would know a few words, but I didn't really know how to put a serious sentence together or speak fluently. And at that age, my early twenties, you know, I wanted. You know, I wanted to social life. I didn't want to live like a monk, you know, and, and, and so I, you know, you, you really have to pick it up. And, and so I was learning the language. And also, 
it came up that in 1969, when I was into my final year in the law school, uh, the Sherbrooke Daily Record, and we're into a daily newspaper here, albeit a small one, eight or 9,000 circulation, came up for sale on a distressed basis because they, they, they overcommitted to buying a press thinking they could sell enough business on the press to pay for it, and they didn't, so they were, they were strained. So Peter White and a, a third friend of ours and I bought that paper. So in that space of time, I became, you know, I, I, I made a major advance in my academic career, qualified myself uh, as a law graduate, uh, picked up, a, if I may say it, a pretty good, solid competence in French, and became a newspaper co-owner. I believe I was the only publisher of a daily newspaper, certainly the only one I've ever heard of anywhere, who was at the same time a law student. Now, there may have been others, but I haven't heard of anything like that. And, and so that, that it was really out of that brief period, the rest of, or at least much of the balance of my career was launched. I know that, you know, that, that happens to everybody, I suppose, but it was a slightly different pattern for me than most people. Why law? Yeah, look, it's uh, it's the neutral place. It was not that I ever particularly desired to be a lawyer, but you never go wrong with it. You know, it always helps you as a qualification for whatever you're going to do. And parts of it are an interesting subject. Now, I focused on uh, constitutional and international and, uh, and um, you know, heaven help anyone relying on my recollections of the Quebec Civil Code to get them through a you know, a median wall case or some one of you know, these funny minor bits of litigation you get. But, but, uh, but you know, the law is a broad field. And there's lots of stuff that's interesting. You know, I, I never particularly desired to practice. I never did practice. I had a couple of minimum wage cases where our company was the defendant. You know, I, got, I got Brian Mulroney, who was a labor lawyer, to coach me a bit. And I did exactly what he told me to, and we won the two cases. But that, that was the only, that's the only practice. I've ever had. I will say that it's been very useful to me. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I've uh, you know I've had a great deal of legal experience as a uh, as a, uh, a client of lawyers, including some very famous lawyers in the United States and Britain and Canada. But uh, but uh, and and that 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 does help you if you if you know something about it, the, the basis of the law it does help you in dealing with lawyers. So how did you manage your, your career as a publisher and your studies at that point? Well, I was a pretty much of an absentee publisher. Uh, I, I would come there when I could and do certain things. And I called upon certain advertisers in Montreal and Toronto when I, when I was able to. Uh, but, but uh, you know, I, that was, in, uh, that was uh, uh, what, nine months before I graduated. After that, I was a mm -hmm. resident publisher. And then we started to build the business and branched out and bought more papers and it grew and grew. So the first paper that you bought, you did, you did, you said uh, the bulk of the writing. And so how much time were you spending writing in a week at that point? Oh, well, when, when I was the resident uh, publisher of a weekly paper? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it took uh, probably eight or 10 hours to write the main contents of the paper so uh, for each week i mean you know yeah it's not it's not absolutely the uh, uh you know the chronicles of uh, you know it's not it's not the best collected editorials of the london times and the no Wall but Street you have to right. commit to produce it no yeah you gotta you gotta get it to paper yes I mean, I mean people are often curious about what it takes to be a writer and i mean one of the things that it takes to be a writer is to write and, and to produce constantly and, and on a schedule, at least that's how it seems to me. And it, it appears that, that you, had a, you had a deadline that was continually renewing itself and you had to produce content come hell or high water fundamentally. Yeah, and what you've said is very perceptive is now, I, I, I mean, you've, there's no reason why you would know this, but I have millions of readers in the United States. I write these columns, and not four of them, every week in the U.S., and it's just what you said. It's a deadline that comes up all the time. Now, yeah, you know, it's only uh, twelve hundred uh, words, so it's not you know it's not that much writing. But on the other hand, you know, it, it, it's a highly competitive field, and you don't, and no one's going to pay you if no one reads you. So you have to put down something. Yeah, well, and that's still three hundred and sixty-five thousand words. No, not a year. You said weekly. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, right. It, so it's a hundred thousand words a year. It's a book a year. Hundred thousand words a year. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, this is true. And, and uh, now, you know, you know, the news cycle is what it is. And there's always plenty to write about. But um, uh, but that got me into that habit. You're absolutely right. Where you're writing to a deadline, and you can't balk at the deadline. If I if I could make a detour here, but a, a relevant one, uh, uh, as 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 you know, and many of your viewers would, uh, I was for a time a guest of the people of the United States in the Bureau of Prisons. Now, I ultimately won that battle. I won it entirely, and in addition, ultimately the charge, charges were retroactively withdrawn. But and it was it was an outrage from A to Z. But but my what I did while I was there was I was a tutor to students who did not succeed in the program the US Bureau of Prisons has of requiring everyone who was not graduated from secondary school to do so. And so they have teachers and examinations every month. And those who were unsuccessful, I would send to me. And I recruited other tutors. I recruited a a former um, head of the torpedo room of a nuclear submarine as my science tutor, because I'm not qualified to do that. And for mathematics, the uh, head of mathematics, former head of mathematics of a large high school in Little Rock, Arkansas, was also a successful commodities trader. And these were people that were imprisoned at the same yeah, time? Yes. Uh, yeah. I, uh, uh, but, you know, the nonviolent things. I think one was a tax case and the other was a alleged fraudulent use of a credit card or something, but they but they're highly qualified people. So the three of us were were tutoring these people and and um, and the, these people would be sent to us and they would arrive very kind of sullen and suspicious, which the conduct of the American criminal legal system uh, invites and incites and then largely justifies. Um, and I would give them a little speech that they didn't have to do a thing if they didn't want to. But if they wanted to leave there with their foot on the up escalator and, a, and an excellent chance to make a good living in a way that didn't lead straight back to a place like this, I could help them. If they didn't want that, that was fine. I didn't care, but I was there if, if, if they wanted. But the one thing I didn't want was for them to imagine that I was part of this awful system. I was a bigger victim of it than they probably were because I didn't commit any of this. With that, it, the whole thing turned and they became fully cooperative. And it wasn't so why what, did that speak? Okay, why did you formulate that speech? Why did you think it was justifiable? And why did it have a positive effect on, on the people that you were discussing? It, because they had, the, the, in that great rich country of the United States, and I'm not a socialist, but they had not had a fair deal. Uh, I mean, most of them had, scarcely had any idea who their father was, and 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 from early times, their mother or somebody was saying, "Somebody's got to get some money here. We're going to be out in the street," and um, and they were just cannon fodder in the drug war. I mean, they were at the last edge. They were the last edge of transfer. So some druggie was picked up. They say, hey, "Where did you get that from?" And they finger that person, and you know, and and and. and you know, the, they, they were they were cooked. So off they went to prison, terribly over sentenced. I, one of my students got 25 years for driving a truck loaded with marijuana. He wasn't even a user himself. Anyway, you know, a lad of 23 or something. Uh, but by the way, I am one thing I am proud of in in, the, in that same sense as the my initial uh, graduation from high school myself was that all of my lads passed, 206. Now, some of them had to take exams more than once, but they all graduated. Hmm. How, long uh, were you, how long were you imprisoned in doing this? Uh, three years and two weeks. How long did it take after you were in prison before you started doing this tutoring, and why did you do it? No, no, I, I, oh, you mean it one, how, how long after I arrived in prison did it start? Yes. Oh, only about a month, because one of my books was in the library, and the head of education said, Look here, we, we, we've got to do something with these guys who just keep failing. I mean, there's nothing wrong with their IQ, but let's try something different. Instead of our teachers, would you do it? And and then then I would that, and to answer your question about why I gave them a little speech, so called. It was hardly a speech, but it was just a, I, I pretty much said to you what I said to them. Uh, it was because I, I I knew that they initially would think I was part of this evil system. 
uh, that they hated. And, and I had to make them understand that I was one of them and not one of the others, you see. And that wasn't a pretense. It wasn't a, uh, a falsehood. I was. I mean, I, my heart was with the prisoners and not with the... But you were also selling them something. You were selling them literacy as an escape from their current condition. That's and you it. Could I do was that. selling them self-interest. And, and as yeah. you know, that, that, that's, 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 as the Australians say, it's a trier. Yeah, I mean, that's one that will go, you know. And, and um, uh, but uh, what I was going to say uh, uh, about them was, and, and this is going back to what you were saying about meeting deadlines, the American, or at least the Florida matriculation system, that's, that's where it was, um, required an essay. And so I said, all right, uh, you know, write an essay. And they, they had various topics that were usually used. So I said, take your pick of these. And some of, some of these fellows literally couldn't write a word. They, they had a mental block, they couldn't write a word. And the way I got around that was, I said, look, we'll change the subject here. You write on the sexiest woman you've ever seen. And you can use your imagination. There doesn't have to be such a woman. You can just make her up. And, you, and only I will read this. So if it'll help you, be uh, as coarse and vulgar as you want, use any sexual word you want, any way you want, anything. Just write what comes to mind, you see? and uh, and that got them all going. None of them had a had a had a, a mental okay, block so after that. Why in the world did you take that tack, and what made them? Why in the world did they trust you? And then I have another question too, which is why did they pass? Why were you successful when the when the other teachers, let's say, or the system that was hypothetically designed to educate them, failed? Well, because they wouldn't put out for them. They thought it was another trick of the, you know, the establishment to to use them. And they, in, in their minds, they were obliged to provide them food and shelter. And, uh, and as long as they would just sort of sullenly went along with things, they didn't harass them too much. And that, so that was minimum compliance, but it was a survival regime for them. And that was really where their lives were reduced to at that point. And so I, I produced a sort of spark of light that they could actually better their lot, raise their higher ability and therefore their legitimate, by which I mean legal uh, income aspiration. Because if they matriculated from high school, they were more hireable than if they hadn't been. And, and indeed, and in the case of a number of them, uh, I, I assisted them in becoming correspondence students in universities. And, and indeed, I had a, a couple of them who started there, then were released and continued physically at the university and graduated. I, I had one a couple of years ago wrote me when he graduated from the University of Alabama. It's more than a couple of years ago now, it's about six years ago, but he graduated from the University of Alabama. And, and, and uh, I, to the extent I'm in touch with these people, they're all doing fine. They're all well launched, doing fine. Hmm. Well, this is, this is, you obviously take pleasure in this particular accomplishment. You see, it was ironic, uh, Jordan, because I didn't, I mean, you know, I had a few teachers I liked. We all remember the teachers we liked, but there weren't that many of them in my case. And most of them I didn't like. I, I bought into the into the view that really they were teachers because they couldn't make it in the world of adults. So they sought success in a place where they could assert their authority over smaller people. And, and I mean, this was my concept of the motivation of some of the teachers I had. But, um, and you know, Shaw's famous comment, he who can does and he who cannot teaches. I, I sort of believed that. I thought they were, you know, I, 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 well, there were exceptions, but in general, I thought, these teachers were people who couldn't make it in a more substantial occupation. Now that was an unfair judgment, but 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 on the other hand, when I see what uh, what level of education those uh, who depart our schools uh, achieve nowadays, I'm not so sure it was an unjust judgment. But in any case, that's what I thought. But I saw the other side of it when I was tutoring these guys. In, in the prison system. You, I saw the satisfaction of it. And I will give the Bureau of Prisons this, they devised this graduation ceremony and all the families would come and uh, they were emotional occasions. And I, I, I'm not a particularly emotional person, but, but one of the few seriously emotional, positive emotional moments I've had was when 
my two colleagues and I were introduced and, and this whole packed room stood up and cheered for about five minutes. Mm, and, mm. you know, the, the, the girlfriends or wives or parents or whatever of, of, of my students would meet my wife in the, in the visiting center and say, oh, your husband is, you know, my guy's a teacher and we're so grateful to you and all this stuff. It was, it was very touching. And incidentally, um, Jordan, prison isn't the place for those people. I was in a low security place. Sir. None of these guys were violent and they, they weren't habitual offenders. It wasn't the right place for them. Uh, that's not the way we should treat these people. Well, they're not return. bad people and they're not unintelligent. And as I say, every one of mine passed. The problem was they just got a wrong turning early on. So let's return to the to the newspaper business. So now you're out of law school and you've yeah. you have a second newspaper and you you're you've graduated now you've taken on the role as a publisher How, your empire starts to expand at that point it, it does but i i had one more uh one more lap to run on the educational oh, side please, well, please do. I, I became a, a master's candidate and uh, and did receive the degree from mcgill in french canada studies now, this, this came from, um, I mean, not that you've asked me that I'm volunteering it, that um, I went, I, I, because I knew Premier Johnson a bit, if, I, I don't know how conversant you are with modern Quebec history, but he was often referred to as the son Duplessis never had. Uh, Maurice Duplessis, as you probably know, was the, he was the only person in history to serve five terms as Premier of Quebec, and he died in office. And, and Jean Lesage told me that if he'd lived, he would have been reelected. He, he was, he, he really knew how to, uh, you know, how to organize that province politically. Uh, and, um, uh, he, but he was a bachelor, and, but he, he, he advanced Johnson quite quickly. And Johnson was kind of his protege. And, and uh, he had the same speaking style, very witty way of talking. And, um, uh, he, uh, I, he in, inspired my interest in Duplessis because up until then I had the what was the conventional English Canadian view that Duplessis was really a, 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 a retrograde political character and a scoundrel uh, I mean a colorful man and a clever man no doubt but a cynic and essentially much too authoritarian um, I mean there's some truth in that but he, he, the fact is he produced the modernization of Quebec. He built the auto routes, he built the schools, he built every university except McGill. I mean, he was reelected because he delivered for the province. And, um, uh, and, but his technique was to get the nationalists and the conservatives to vote together, which is uh, very difficult to do. Either you're too nationalistic and frighten the conservatives, which happened to him in 1939, or, or, or you're not nationalistic enough and, 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 and they get impatient with you, which is what happened to Jean-Jacques Bertrand in 1970. Uh, I mean, Duplessis had it all organized for Paul Sauvé to follow him and Daniel Johnson to follow him, but Duplessis was a strong man who was almost 70 when he died in office. Those two died in office in the early 50s, so, and, and then the whole thing broke up. But my point was that um, uh, Johnson stirred my curiosity about Duplessis because there clearly was a story to this man that wasn't being told. He was reviled as the author of the great darkness and all this sort of thing. So I went to a colloquy, uh, happened to get an invitation and it came from Miss Griffith, who I mentioned, it was my old professor at Carleton, who said, you might be interested in this. So I went to it in Three Rivers and it was a discussion of Duplessis. And, it, and, and there was a panel, and there was one pro Duplessis panelist and two anti Duplessis ones. And I went up to the pro Duplessis one at the end of it. It was the somewhat well known historian Robert Rumi, a Frenchman originally, who, who was a member of Action Francaise, you know, Charles Maurras. And he was at a demonstration in the Place de la République in 1926. And the person next to him was shot dead. And with that, he left France and never returned, emigrated to Quebec. Anyway, he. Um, I congratulated him on upholding Duplessis, and we conversed for a while, and uh, and then I gave him a ride back to Montreal, and uh, and uh, and it, it turned out that he had been commissioned by an outfit called, in French, the Society of Friends of the Honorable Maurice Duplessis, to write a book about Duplessis, and and they had all Duplessis' papers, 
and so I, 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 the ideas that came to my mind, well, look, you're writing in French, would they have any interest in, show, in allowing an English speaking person to look at them and, and, and write about that? And he said, well, it's worth a try. Sure, well, I'll recommend you, you say. And, and, uh, and then it happened, the head of this outfit was the former Minister of Cultural Affairs in Johnson and Bertrand's government, Jean-Noël Tremblay, you, you may remember. And he's still alive, he's very elderly. Uh, and, 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 and so he said, yeah, well, that's fine. Sure, you can, you, 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 but you know, you've got to keep them to yourself and stuff, but all of which I, the rules I respected. And so I had all this stuff. And then when I saw what I had, I realized I had to do something about it. And this is what takes me back to having developed at least the ambition to write some history. So I calculated that if I enrolled at McGill, citing this as my proposed thesis topic, that would get me halfway through. And if I got halfway through, I'd, I'd have the momentum to finish it. And that's where my first book came from, which, uh, which is called uh, Render Unto Caesar, The Life of Maurice Duplessis. And, uh, and um, so, the, so I, I got that side of things going at the same time as we built our newspaper company. And we, and we bought within a few months a daily newspaper in Prince Edward Island and one in Prince Rupert, British Columbia. So I could say with a semi straight face, we have a newspaper chain that spans the country from ocean to ocean. <laughs> but I said, well, you know, the, the, the links are rather, are rather wide and not many of them. So you're writing, you're done your law degree, you're writing now as well, and you've got three newspapers at this point? Well, then there were some weeklies. We were up to probably as many as 10, but then we, we had some weeklies around Quebec. And then we got, we see, there were some available ones in British Columbia, dailies and weeklies. So it, it, we, we built it up. It was still a small company compared to, you know, the ones that own the big newspapers in the country. We, but we built it up to something, a bit of, scale and stature fairly quickly but but it was a it's a it was a very profitable business and normally we would um we would we make a make a bid based on the profitability of the present owner and and very rarely were these people who owned the papers running them as profitably as they could <clears throat> they were taking a nice salary for themselves and they weren't that concerned with the, what the profit well, we had an idea of what we could do with the profit. And, and, then, and then in those days, you could go to the local bank and say, uh, look, we, we, you know, we want to buy this paper. And uh, we want, we, we're asking you to loan us half the money. We'll take care of the rest. And what we do is we give the vendor a balance of sale in the rest. So we didn't put up anything, not a cent. Hmm. And, but, but we always did raise the profit. We always raised the quality of the product too. And our position always was, that the best way to raise the profit was to raise the, the quality of the product. And even then, people who bought and read a newspaper were what is called ABC, ABC One readers, either high income or high education, relatively speaking. I mean, ignorant people didn't buy newspapers. And, 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 and for the most part, poor people didn't buy newspapers. And people advertisers wouldn't be interested in wouldn't buy a newspaper. But anyone who bought a newspaper is someone an advertiser wants to get to because he has disposable income. How much was your ability to make these newspapers that you purchased profitable and also to see an opportunity there, a consequence of you having done everything when you bought your first newspaper? Uh, considerable, because I, I knew how much manpower you needed. And, and almost always these places had more manpower than they needed. Now, you know, we handled it gently, you know, we moved them out, you know, basically a lot of them were elderly. So we just gave them early retirement and topped up their pensions a bit and things like that. But, but, um, and they're small, so you're not talking about a lot of people, but if, if you, if you've got a newspaper with 50 employees and you get eight of them to take early retirement, you've, you've got the payroll by almost 20%. And, and, um, and it's not that early retirement, you know, and in addition to that, there are all kinds of things to do to enhance revenue. I mean, very few of them had any notion of how you, uh, you know, how you can um, hype the circulation relatively easily with contests and things like that. I, I was astounded at the people and where we really saw this was in England, where the Daily Telegraph, the daily circulation of over a million broadsheet papers, the biggest broadsheet paper in, in Europe. Um, 
uh, the British love these, as far as I'm concerned, utterly ridiculous contests. But if you give them a contest, even to get a, you know, a free subscription to the Spectator, which we also own, uh, they'll plunge into it. It's a circulation bill. So uh, that's the sort of thing that a, you know, an individual sitting in, for argument's sake, Nelson, British Columbia, having owned this newspaper for 30 years, he wouldn't know that. It wouldn't matter. He lived well. He was an influential person in his community, made a profit every year, having taken a nice salary for himself, his three or four relatives in the payroll. You know, uh, the, 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 the company owns his car and owns his speedboat and the lake and all this kind of stuff. I mean, to him, that's all he needs, you know, which is fine. But the fact is you can double the profits quite quickly. So now, do you have a plan at this point? You're, you're being successful in purchasing newspapers and increasing their profitability. So you're building up more capital. Are you, are you planning? Do you have an aim at this point just to continue expanding? And, and do you yeah, have an this, end this in was mind? Our plan. And, we, and we brought it a, a long way forward. The biggest, uh, the biggest paper we had when things changed because of that shakeup in the Ravelston Argus thing that you mentioned in your intro, uh, whereupon I started to focus on finance, um, was Le Soleil in Quebec City, which Sir Wilfrid Laurier was once the chairman. And that was a newspaper of about 120,000 circulation a day. It's not big for Toronto, but it's, uh, that's, that's, what is it? It's, uh, you know, I'm trying to, I, I, I don't know the newspaper circulation now. I've been out of the business for a long time, but you know, that, that's 120,000 papers a day. It's a respectable sized paper. It's not a huge newspaper, but it's not, it's not like the Knowlton Eastern Townships Advertiser, either. And uh, there was some history to the Soleil as well. It's a well-known paper in Quebec. So you, by you, the way, the, the, the history part that I best knew was from my studies of Duplessis, where the, you know, it was, as I said, Sir Wilfred was the chairman at one time, it was an absolute dyed in the wool liberal newspaper. But uh, the, the owner, Jacob Nicole, he, and he owned the newspapers in Three Rivers and Sherbrooke uh, also. Um, he, he, was, he was one of the few people who was a senator and a legislative counselor to the upper house of Quebec in those days. He was both at the same time. And, uh, and he was the Liberal Party chairman for 20 years provincially while they were in office just before Duplessis and for nearly 20 years after when they were in office in Ottawa. He was a very powerful man in Quebec. And in the early days of television, he, he got the license, uh, doubtless through his political contacts, for eastern Quebec, southeastern Quebec, around Sherbrooke. And the best place to put his transmitter was at the top of Mount Orford, which was a provincial park. So he asked Duplessis if he could put his, his, you know, his transmitter there. And Duplessis said, uh, you know, Jacob, you can, you can put it there and you don't have to pay me more than $1 rent for it, me being the province of Quebec, uh, uh, but not as long as right under the words Le Soleil on your leading newspaper, or the words the liberal orga. He said, right. At that point, Le Soleil, never mind that Mr. Nicole was a liberal senator and legislative counselor, became a Union National newspaper. He just switched like that and he got his license. Anyway, that, 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 <laughs> when I, that's a, in a way a red herring, but I thought, I thought it might amuse your uh, viewers a bit. All right. So you're building up a newspaper empire. It's, it's, it's in Canada. It's limited to Canada at this point, but you start to expand. Is it first in the U.S. or first in the U.K.? And how does that no, come we, we started to move in the U.S. in, um, let me think now. We got going there in about uh, 70, 75. We bought a paper just over the border in Vermont. And then, and then, and then it grew. I mean, of course, in a market that size, we, we we fairly rapidly bought a huge number of these small papers. We had a formula to operate them, and, and you could bundle them together by region. And then, when you when you combined their circulation, they became quite substantial in circulation. You had enough of them. And and as you said in your intro, we had hundreds of these papers. And were you run? Were you running writers across the papers, or were you, these all in 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 independent fiefdoms? There were a few that we that we could we could run or 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 buy from the outside at a discount for ourselves, rather than at the unit cost that that, that, that 
obtained if we were only buying for one little paper, 10,000 sale or something like that. But we got economies of scale to a degree. But in the papers like that, you, you absolutely have to serve the local public. And, and you're relatively speaking, not under threat from television, let alone once it came the internet, as much in those local papers, because, you know, CBS or the CBC or whatever you want are not going to carry the, you know, the, the strawberry festival of the town your paper's published in, you know, they, they, they just don't have the room for it. So you're giving people what they can't get anywhere else. And is that still the case? Are, are the smaller community uh, newspapers well, still managing? The internet, uh, the internet has become so pervasive now. I, I, I think it's a threat even to those papers, but, mm-hmm. but not, as, not as much as it is to a metropolitan paper. So how are you managing your time at this point? You have, you have an increasingly large media empire. You're also well, still we, writing, we I presume. Well, we divided it in, into, into regions, and I had the East, and Associates had the West. And then, uh, then they... they Big turn came in the matter you referred to when the, uh, uh, you know, when the, what was called at the time the Argus Group of Companies, the control of it became available, and uh, that that was quite an intricate business because the number of voting shares involved was quite small. So you you would I, I, because my father had had his position, he died in 1976. So my brother and I, we technically we didn't inherit his stock; we bought it from his estate, but but. In, in effect, we inherited it, and, um, and and then the, there was a shareholders agreement, and then, uh, the the principal associate died, and there was some jockeying around. And in any case, we, in accordance with the shareholders agreement, we bought the other stock, so we had we had control of the voting shares, which had uh, of, of this company, which had influential blocks of stock and historically controlling blocks of stock, although for in most cases, they weren't a majority of the shares of a number of famous companies. Massey Ferguson was one, the farm equipment maker, and Dominion stores, the grocery stores, Domtar, the old uh, forestry products company. And um, uh, the most interesting in a way was the old, the old Hollinger mining company. It didn't do much mining, but it owned 60% of, of an outfit that, that owned big iron ore positions in, in Labrador and Northern Quebec and long-term contracts to ship the ore that produced about $40 million of royalties every year, at basically no cost. The, the, the steel companies and their affiliates in the United States took the ore out and paid us the royalties. So we had that cash to work with. And then, and then what I did was over a period, I reoriented that flow of cash and that business into the newspaper business. And we really, really took off when, uh, when I, I bought control of the London Daily Telegraph, which was in a distressed financial state for $30 million, which we ultimately sold for $1.327 billion. How much? How how long a period of time elapsed between the purchase and the sale? From uh, 1986 to uh, 2004. So, so 18, uh, 18, eight, 18 years. 18 years. Yeah. 18 years. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. that's quite the return on investment. So, are you in England? You you, you buy the Telegraph. Are you spending much of your time in Britain at that point? Uh, well, after we bought it, I, I I went there for two years in the summers only, and then I. Uh, may, and then I made it my chief residence after that for uh, about 15 years. Yeah, so what was it like moving from Toronto to Britain? Well, I, I kept my home and my office here, but uh, in the sense you mean it, I mean it, yes, I moved my main residence. Well, look, it, it, it moving into Britain as an owner of a big newspaper uh, is not like just, you know, getting off the plane at Heathrow and going through the want ads to find a job for yourself you know so I I was rather well received because of the position I had uh but it was very interesting it's a it's a a, I I was fortunate to get the very tail end of that era when the newspaper owners were very influential people Uh, I mean I I don't think they are particularly influential now but then it's not it's not a good business now but um uh it, it 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 you know, London is one of the world's greatest cities, and if, if you're 
well situated in London, you meet a tremendous variety of interesting people who are who either live there or come through there. Virtually everybody you can think of comes through London at some point in a year, and and, and there you know there's normally some sort of occasion for them. So my wife and I were constantly receiving these formidable sort of stiff gold-edged invitations to come to have dinner with so-and-so or lunch with so-and-so or something and, and uh it, it you know it was a sumptuous life but but um but i mean my interest in it was really in, in the socializing with people as well as at that time I, I was a supporter of mrs thatcher and 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 it was a very interesting and active time politically in britain as she effectively desocialized the country how well and did you the, know her i got to know her very well she was my sponsor in the house of lords and 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 she and dennis came to our wedding party and they often came to dinner with us so you you went you went to you lived in britain after you were in canada how it'd be interesting for me to hear how you would contrast the cultures what was it like being in Britain, I mean, I know you were in a, in, a, in a very fortunate position when you moved there, and so you you entered in the upper echelons of society, but you had a chance to see Britain from the inside and to contrast it with Canada and with the U.S. to some degree. So so what did you observe and what did you conclude? Uh, well, it, it, it was a country being renewed, you know. I mean, Britain, uh, at the time that Thatcher was elected, very narrowly elected in 1979, was a country with tight currency controls, uh, top personal tax rate of 98%. So there's a lot of tax cheating going on. And the British don't like that, you know. I mean, the, the, the real problem with Britain and Europe was not immigration, it was, it, it was the authoritarianism of directives from Brussels. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the French and the Italians essentially ignore the government as much as they can anyway, and they don't care what these directives are. They're not going to pay much attention to them unless they absolutely have to. And the French in particular are not going to take seriously anything that comes from the Belgians, and, or at least from within Belgium. And, uh, and the Germans are the leading power in Europe, and they're accustomed to regimentation, so it doesn't bother them. But the British like to be law-abiding. They like to obey the law, but, but they have to be sensible laws, and they have to be uh, uh, imposed by people that are accountable. So if you don't like what they're doing, you can throw them out at the, at the, you know, at the voting place. And, and that was the problem. Well, it, that, in addition to the economic stagnation, finally, finally you know, boiled over when Thatcher and her friends, Keith Joseph and, and others, pushed out Ted Heath, Sir Edward Heath, and, and took the Conservative Party of Great Britain, Conservative and Unionist Party, to, to the right, not the extreme right, but to a level of conservatism that um, conservative fiscal policy and tax policy in particular, uh, and attitude to, to labor unions, that, that the Conservative Party had not occupied really since uh, the early days of Stanley Baldwin. And, uh, and, and, and it wasn't back to then, but it was ideologically a similar position, but obviously refined to reflect changes in society uh, over that period of more than 50 years. And so it was very interesting to see, and she was successful. I mean, I, I, I was there uh, for her uh, third election victory. She was the first prime minister since before the first reform act in the early 1830s to win three consecutive full terms, majority terms as prime minister. And, uh, and she did it on the basis of radical change to the country. And it was quite exciting. Now, at that time, that was, uh, that was in the late 80s. Uh, um, now, Brian Mulroney was an old friend of mine. Uh, he, 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 was, he was, I mean, your question didn't deal with politics only, but that, given my position as a news, in newspaper business, politics had a lot to do with things. Um, and Brian was doing something about it, but Canada as old was operated, you know, much closer to the middle of the field. Uh, uh, you know, it, it never got that far left and, and, and he didn't move it as far as Thatcher moved Britain. And in any case, the 
you know, it's not a unitary state like Britain. It's a much different system. But they, the, um, uh, it, 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 you, you didn't have. I mean, I thought Brian was a good prime minister, but you didn't have that sense of profound change and radical change and exciting policy formulation. I mean, it was one of the few periods in my life where I sort of transmogrified into a into a sort of semi-policy wonk, you say, because we had the positions and all this stuff. And the other aspect of it was the, the Cold War was still going on, and there was still some controversy in Britain in that there, there was always in the left wing of the Labour Party, especially, and the, and the far out old imperialist wing of the Tories as well, uh, the, this, this antagonism to the United States. And um, uh, when I moved there, it was in the latter Reagan years, and of course he was an important president and and had an eventful period as president. And uh, and and I it happened I knew him too, and I'd known him before he was president. And um, uh, so I, I I you know I wasn't under the illusion that I was at the center of things. I wasn't, but I was I was actually pretty close to the center in Britain because. Um, my first trip there as the chief shareholder of, of the Telegraph Company, the prime minister invited me to lunch on Saturday at Checkers. And uh, she said, look here, you know, we need you. We can't win without you. Are you, are, are you with us? And I said, oh, yeah, oh, I'm with you all. And, and I said, but let me ask you something. And this was right after Mr. Murdoch had, uh, you know, had, had, made his big changeover and moved to a new plant and decertified and basically dismissed the old, uh, you know, the, the, the old pre-print and printing unions that used to shut the papers down all the time arbitrarily. I mean, the shop foreman would have a, you know, lose a game of darts at his pub or something and come in and call all the workers out. It was almost as bad as that. And, and, and she, since Murdoch was acting within the law, she ensured that his titles could be produced. I said, look, I don't think we're going to get to the point that Rupert's at, or, uh, but you know, we're, we're putting through uh, voluntary retirements, but you don't know. And if we need to import people from other countries to help get our papers out, she interrupted me and said, I'll sign the work permits myself. And uh, that, that was it as Charles Powell, her, long-serving chief secretary, very distinguished public servant in Britain, wrote, uh, politically speaking, it was love at first sight. I mean, he was there at that luncheon. And we just got on like smoke and did right to the day she died. Well, she was a little non-compassment, non slatterly, but uh, you know, she was, I, I knew her well. I knew her very well. And, and as I you... said, at our, at our Barbara's and my wedding party, I thanked her and said, if it, you know, I, I, I never would have come to this country or wished to do business in this country if it wasn't for you. And that was true. So what, what made her able to do what she did? I mean, she was a woman in a sea of men. She was uh, a radical leader in many ways, obviously on the conservative front. She had apparently had tremendous strength of character. Like what did you see in her that made her able to do what she did? Uh, she was an extremely courageous person. And she was that type of person who focused exclusively on relevant sequential facts in analyzing a problem. And, and she, you know, she had been, a, I believe, the education secretary in the Heath government, 70 to 74, and, and, and was the co-founder of the Center for Policy Studies. She came to the conclusion, along with a number of others, some of them were intellectually more, frankly, sophisticated than she was, like Keith Joseph, uh, that, that Britain simply had to change, that the, what was called the Attlee Settlement, where, where it, it, it was colloquially in Britain called Butskillism after Rab Butler uh, and Hugh Gateskill, who was, Gateskill was the leader of the Labour Party between Clement Attlee and Harold Wilson, and and Rab Butler was the deputy prime minister for, and and all was the runner-up to leader all through the Churchill, Eden, Macmillan, 
years into into the Heath period, and 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 uh, 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 Sir Alec did this to him also, and it was it was kind of a lookalike government show where they agreed in most things. And uh, Margaret concluded, "This isn't working. Britain is is falling behind. Our standard of living is is not keeping pace with the Germans or the French or the Americans." And um, and and this is why, and we've got to change. And she was absolutely right. But you know, sometimes just stating home truths in simple ways is, is, is so far from what people are used to. It sounds more radical than it is. What she was saying wasn't, in fact, all that radical. She was saying things like, "We can't have just completely irresponsible work stoppages. We can't have capricious middle-level union officials just calling everybody out." For the fun of it, whenever they, you know, had a bad night or something, and 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 we can't take ninety eight percent of people's income. I mean, it's nonsense. I mean, it's just nonsense. It, it'll it'll cost ninety nine cents to collect the ninety eight cents. You know? I mean, your collection costs get too high. Cheating becomes outrageous. Rich people move away. Uh, it, it, it's just nonsense. And um, and she had a way of putting it very clearly and very persuasive. And, and that group was, was an ideal team for that time. She had, she had some people, Nigel Lawson, for example, was a, a former editor of The Spectator, a senior writer for the Financial Times, a academic economist, but, but a, a fine debater. And, and he, could, he, he put through absolutely radical budgets where you know, they, they cut the top tax rate between Jeffrey Howe and Nigel, they cut it from 98% to 40%. And, 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 and you know, she had, a, she had a, a group that could argue it in parliament and in the country. She had an academic group led by Keith Joseph and her Center for Policy Studies group, uh, 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 Kenneth Minogue, I don't know if you know these people, well-known academic economists and specialists in other areas who could put it forward in a way that was where they could defend it against you know the best debaters of the left and she was a powerful leader who kept the whip on the backs of the Tory party and said this is what must be done and this is why we have to do it and and uh, you, you know when she said the lady's not for turning and sacked half her government and so forth uh, she showed I mean she was right but 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 there's no doubt that at times traditional opinion within that party and the Tory grandees didn't approve of her and they never liked her and they stabbed her in the back in the end. But even those who were involved in that had to admit that she made a, a tremendous difference and and the best of them, for example, Michael Heseltine, very able man, uh, a very good defense secretary, and then came back in other roles. But uh, he. Uh, he agreed with her policy. He couldn't stand her person, and she couldn't stand him. But, but he, but he, he, he was he was no slacker when it came to the to the policy. She was she was the right person for the right time. Now, unfortunately, um, as so often happens when when people in democratic countries have held a, a, an elected office for for a while, she started to lose her sense of political self preservation. Uh, and I, 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 you know, I, I became because we had a big parliamentary contingent in the, in the press gallery and did a lot of political reporting. And Neil Kinnock, the leader of the opposition, labor leader, told me one day that the first parliamentary report he read every morning was ours, because even though we were a rabidly pro-Thatcher paper, the reporting was always fair and always perceptive. And that was our standard. And that was what I always tried to enforce everywhere in every country. In all our papers was to separate reporting and comment, which you rarely get nowadays. And um, as the agitation with Thatcher's authoritarianism within the conservative parliamentary party increased, we, we would hear it naturally and the editors would tell me these things. So I said, all right, look, put 10 more people into the press gallery. I mean, they, 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 you know, they give a press pass to anyone that the Telegraph asked for, given our position. And um, I mean, you know, we were the backbone of the nation. You know, we had over a million sale and 98% of them were conservative voters. And uh, 
uh, and I said, for once, I will, I will ignore your expense accounts, which were outrageous. They always are from journalists. And I, I almost sacked the editor when, uh, when he expected me to pay for chartering a helicopter to take him to a drinks party in Brighton. But I said, look, you know, I'll, I'll ignore all, all of that. Tell these guys, divide it up. Take the entire conservative parliamentary party, every MP, divide them up into groups. And over the next few months, have your guys take them all out and ply them with drink and find out what is really going on there. And when I had all this, I asked for an appointment. The prime minister's office said to come over later that day. And, and, and I said, look, this is what I've done. I did, obviously, I didn't name anyone. That would be dishonorable. I did not give one name. But for example, the chief whip, Renton, his name was, we, we couldn't wait to see the back of Thatcher. And I don't think she, had, she hadn't a clue of this. So I didn't mention him. I didn't mention anybody. I said, I'm telling you, Prime Minister, your parliamentary party is seething with discontent. There's an absolute rancid element there. And it's very, it's, it's gone a long way into that group. And you, you've, you've got to, if you pardon my being so uh, imperious here, uh, if, if you, you, you've got to, I'm not saying you should accommodate or appease them, but make a few course corrections that, win, you know, that attract more of them and turn, break the momentum of this. And um, I said, oh, rubbish, absolute rubbish. She said, they're all slackers, they're cowards. They're co I said, of course they're cowards, that's what makes them dangerous. And, 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 and you know, and it was only a few weeks later that, uh, you know, she, uh, pushed poor old Jeffrey Howe out and, uh, uh, and the 1922 Society, the group of non-cabinet MPs in the governing party, uh, essentially gave her the high jump. And, and, and um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was very unfortunate. In the, um, in, we ran an editorial on, on, the, um, on the front page, it was very rare the day before, and, and at which I contributed the last sentence. The editor, Max Hastings, was not a pro-Thatcher person, but I, I, the last sentence was that um, Margaret Thatcher is one of the great leaders who has arisen in a thousand years of British history. And as long as she wishes to remain as prime minister, she may count on the support of this newspaper. And she wrote me a handwritten personal letter thanking me, uh, but, but she went and uh, I, uh, I told the um, editor to put a black border around the story. And he said, I, I, please, you're not serious, are you? So I, I, I spared him that, but that's how I felt. It was, it, was, it, it was a tragedy, not a tragedy, but a sadness. She was a great leader. But you know, Jordan, I don't believe in term limits. I mean, basically the voters will decide and if they've got a good person in office, let, let you keep the person there. And in the United States, the only time in the history of that country or anyone saw the third term, the entire future of our civilization depended on his being elected. And that was Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1940, because uh, the Republicans would never have come up with Lend-Lease and Britain and Canada could not have continued in the war. Um, and they wouldn't have got a war leader as good as that anyway. And Wendell Wilkie was a good man, but he was no FDR. But um, uh, if we look back at it in, in, in the last, what, 50 or 60 years, the only leaders in, uh, you know, in important countries who've left office in good physical health and good political health were the term limited Americans, Eisenhower and Reagan, and uh, maybe Clinton, but more Eisenhower and Reagan. I mean, if, if, if they'd been allowed to and had chosen to do it, either of them would have won a third term easily. They were very popular, but, but you know, you, as Roosevelt said, you've got to have a new, even though it's you running for re-election, it has to be for a new reason. You have to give the people a new reason to vote for, uh, which he did do. I mean, he was, you know, uh, uh, beat the depression, uh, you know, accelerate prosperity, stay out of war, win the war. You know, he had a different, he had a different thing each time. But... Um, uh, I, I, I digress. Now, Margaret Thatcher was she. Her, she was very courageous and very admirable. I, I have to, and, and also a wonderful person in, in small ways. I mean, the staff at Downing Street and Checkers loved her. She was terribly polite to these people in a way that uh, you know. And some of some of the Labour 
prime ministers like Callahan weren't particularly. Um, and, and certainly a man like Ted Heath had no manners anyway, so he wasn't polite to anyone. He was a, I, I mean, I, I rather liked him as a person and he was an interesting man in a way. I didn't particularly like him politically, but, but he, he wasn't very polite. And, but Margaret Thatcher was very polite to those people, no matter how rough she was in her own minister, she felt they could defend themselves. But you know, someone serving tea at Downing Street was couldn't, and so you had to be polite to these people. And she was never condescending about it. I mean, she was from Grantham. Her father was a grocer, and he was ultimately the mayor of Grantham, so he was a, a well-known man in Grantham. But he, but in the world of, of Westminster and uh, uh, Belgravia, and the great and the good, and the dukes and the rich and everything, they they looked upon her as a, a, a ludicrous figure. I mean, some you know, some jumped up the. Uh, uh, battle acts from the Midlands, and 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 uh, and she was never particularly self-conscious about that. But it must be said she she was always a little awkward. And in that way, I had a kind of a past because I wasn't part of the awful class system in Britain. I wasn't anything. I was sort of like like from another planet. But I have to say this about her: she she did not have a good sense of humor. Uh, she she occasionally said funny things, but she wasn't she wasn't a naturally humorous person, uh, which is not the end of the world. But it, it's it's nice if you've got a better sense of humor than she did, and um, and she was a little oversimplified in the view sometimes. I mean, the fact is, when you get right down to it, uh, <clears throat> she didn't like Europe because she, she didn't like the main. European nationalities. I mean, the Germans and the French. She didn't mind the Italians, but she couldn't take the Italians seriously. But 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 she rather liked them. But um, but she she never forgave the Germans for the war, and she and she thought the French were were were, were sharpers and and sly, cunning and devious people, and and. Um, uh, she sort of worked in stereotypes, you know. Now, if she met an individual person from Germany or France, obviously she'd be perfectly polite to them, but fundamentally she, she didn't trust either of those countries and she didn't feel it was really Europe's job to, to lead the Danes and the Dutch and all these smaller countries that wanted Britain in to help them, you see. And um, she rather liked the Americans and, and, and she never forgot, and she told me this many times, she never forgot what the United States did in World War II, how desperate Britain's condition was and, and uh, how uh, overwhelmingly helpful uh, the Americans were. She had great admiration for Roosevelt. And she, she said, uh, and each year from 1942, we'd see more and more of the Americans in Britain. And, and, and I know there were there were frictions here and there and things, but to us it was just wonderfully reassuring. More and more, these big, tall, strong American boys would arrive, ready to invade Europe. And uh, um, she was a, a, her family were practicing Methodists, and every Sunday they would invite an American serviceman for, that they would see in the church service to come back with them to have lunch. So they thought it was the nice thing to do to young men overseas who are missing their families and so on to show some hospitality. Uh, I mean, she was a very genuine, traditional, low church Protestant, but tolerant, no, no religious animosities of any kind. Uh, most of her constituents were Jewish. And, and, um, uh, and, and just straight, what you saw was what you, got, you know, but a very strong, good, well-rounded leader. But if, if, if what you need, which is what they did need, was, was someone to make radical change and, and say the lady is not for turning and this, this is what we have a mandate to do and we're going to do it. She was the perfect leader. Once you got into a, a subtler situation, uh, that would that would not be her forte. I mean, she you wouldn't confuse her with Disraeli or something. I mean, she if she'd gone to the Congress of Berlin instead of Disraeli, uh, they would have ended up at war with Bismarck. You know, I mean, she probably started the, starting as soon as her train left. But uh, but but you know, it was horses for courses, and she was a wonderful leader for the time. As a person, she was an outstanding person, absolutely loyal. I have great admiration for her. great admiration, and for Dennis too. You knew Reagan as well. 
I did. Not as well, but I knew him. Yeah, I knew him. Yep. I knew him before he was president, when he was president, and after he was president. And what were your impressions of him? Uh, 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 extremely formidable man. And he was to start with one of the most charming men I have ever met. I mean, practically all politicians are reasonably uh, charming when they put their minds to it; otherwise, they're in their own business. But uh, he was he was disarmingly. Uh, pleasant without being saccharine or over ingenuous he was just a charming guy good raconteur terrific raconteur very good conversationalist and uh, I, I think he was a great leader i either there's i don't i don't think there's any doubt about that he was a wonderful speaker he kept it to a few basic points he he, he vulgarized them as the french say he made these complicated issues simple and, and it was almost impossible is that something uh, he shared to, with thatcher that capability uh, yes, uh, uh, and uh, but in a slightly different way. He had a more. He would throw in a humorous aspect that was disarming, uh, and 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 he would also um, uh, he he'd, he'd he'd make it a, a little more anecdotal and folksy. She would, mm. and but not 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 where his argument deteriorated. He was a very skillful debater. If if you're interested in this, you can find it on the internet the debate he had with Robert Kennedy over that business about the left-wing academic in New Jersey, Genovese, where he was a far left and there was a dispute about his ability to remain at a, at a state university because he was a communist. And, um, and at the end of it, Robert Kennedy said, don't ever put me into a debate with that guy again. I mean, Reagan, uh, I had some conversations with him where I was astounded, even you know, well after he was president and was supposedly in decline. Where he had an astounding recall of the detail of things. He was a much more comprehensively intelligent person than was widely known, because he he sometimes seemed flat-footed when when a direct question was put to him. You know, the American tradition is not one of debating like it is in the parliamentary tradition. I mean, he was a governor and then the president, and he never debated with anybody other than when he chose to, as with Kennedy or when he actually was in the elections. And uh, but but he, he this idea that that he he was a, a you know what did uh, Clark Clifford call him an amiable dunce or something he uh, I knew Clifford too and Reagan was as smart as Clifford a different type of intelligence but he was a very intelligent man he, it, there was he he was in a way an inspirational figure because in his life he only had six jobs he was a a life uh, you know a guardian of for, for people swimming whatever you, what, what, you know uh, what, what, lifeguard uh, yeah lifeguard uh at tampico illinois and then he was a baseball announcer in des moines iowa california bound in the great depression and then a screen actor uh, including i think six terms as head of the screen actors guild but his job was an actor and then he was the vice president for public and personnel relations for general electric corp and then governor of California and president of the United States. And, and he only, I believe he only had four elections. He beat Edmund G. Brown, who defeated Richard Nixon four years before by over a million votes. And he defeated Jesse Unruh by over a million votes running for re-election as governor. And he beat President Jimmy Carter by I think nine million votes. And then Walter Mondale, who just died the other day, by over 15 million votes. I, I mean, it just, it was just a, a very modest career. He was a graduate of Eureka College, and and then and then he he, he just went all the way up to the top of the country and stayed there. And he, he undoubtedly was a very good president. So, from from this, but temporal... I've got to say this, Ruben yep. uh, 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 Jordan. He uh, he, this, he wasn't Mister Nice Guy. He came across brilliantly as Mister Nice Guy. In that sense, he was a little like FDR. He, Came across a very charming, nice guy, but but uh, you know Ronald Reagan didn't go to the funerals of the people who launched his career, like uh, Alfred Bloomingdale and Justin Dart and Henry Salvatore. So he, you know, he, Nancy Reagan, for all her peculiarities, was was a, was a very human person. Uh, Reagan had wonderful human qualities. I mean, I don't know if you or I, if we had a as General Al Haig said, a round in the chest and a collapsed lung would walk into the emergency room and say, I hope you people are all Republicans the way he did. I mean, that wasn't, that, he wasn't, you know, you know, recording a film there. I mean, he really did have a bullet in his chest, but, but he, 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 he was 
fixated on certain targets. And while he was always, he was always sort of pleasant to everybody, I, I, I never got the impression that he was awash with human sentiment, where in her way, Nancy was, you know. In that way, she was kind of his ambassador to, you know, let your hair down, be spontaneous. And stuff. Mm, yeah, he, it sounded like you were fond of her too. Yeah, I didn't know her as well. I thought she was admirably devoted to him. Uh, I mean, look, there's something about that California thing that spooks me a bit, you know, where she'd consult these uh, uh, astrologers, see seers, and all that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, 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 look, whatever works for you, but that kind of thing make, makes me a bit uneasy. But yeah, she was very nice to you. I have to say, whenever I met her, she was very, very nice. Look, I have to say, whenever I met her, Hillary Clinton was nice, so I don't like her politically. All right, so you're back in Britain. You're 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 running the Telegraph, and you're you're also moving up through the ranks of British society. You're made a, a lord. How did that come about? Well, you know, if you own a big newspaper, you you don't have to do very much for that. You know, you just have to have your party in office, or or indeed now you don't even have to have that. I, I was uh, I was installed by Blair, but I was put up by the Conservative leader at the time, William Hague. Uh, it, that, that's basically an ex officio thing. My predecessor had had it, and his predecessor was, you know, that was Lord uh, Lord Lord Hartwell immediately had of me, and prior to that, Lord Cameras. And what did it mean to you, and what what were the responsibilities that are associated with it? Well, it's what you want to make out of it. I, I mean, if the if I hadn't had my career interrupted as it was, I, I you know I, I would have I, you know I came in as a active peer and I gave a number of speeches and my arrangement with the conservative whips office was that I would not presume to advise the British on their pensions or even their schools but I'd speak on foreign policy and alliance matters and that's what I did and that was at the time of the Iraq war uh, when when incidentally uh, Blair needed us because uh, you know while there are whips in the House of Commons who can normally control the votes it's a life appointment in, in the Lords, so you can do anything you want. The peers can get stuff. There's nothing they can do about it. And, and Blair needed the Conservative peers to support his policy. So he, he phoned a number of us, including me, and, and, and we did support him. Uh, uh, but um, um, I, it's, it's the, if it's a serious subject, it is the best debating forum in the world. And you know it, it has this image of being a, a bunch of you know down at the heel, probably drink sodden descendants of people who d did brilliantly in a hundred years war or something. That isn't what it is. It, it's it's uh, I, I, the numbers fluctuate. It's around eight hundred members now. There are a fixed number of about hundred that are hereditaries, but apart from a few specific office holders like the Duke of Norfolk as Earl Marshall and Premier Duke and. Uh, the Marcus of Salisbury and a couple of others. Uh, the 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 elected, uh, I'm sorry, the the hereditary peers are elected by other hereditaries, so they have a runoff too. I and mean, my friend Lord, Lord Rothermere, owner of the Daily Mail, he 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 didn't win. He was defeated by his fellow hereditary, uh, Lord Rothschild, Jacob Rothschild. He didn't run, but he didn't run because he knew that he wouldn't win. And by by the way, they should. Those are two people who should be there. They're very good people, uh, uh, but the and, and obviously influential people. But the um, uh, in a serious debate, you you know you remember you have the previous chiefs of the defense staff, you have the heads of the main universities, you have leading academics, Asa Briggs, for example. Uh, um, you you have. Um, uh, cultural figures like uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber, Yehudi Menuhin, uh, when I began, um, and, uh, and and you have leaders of great corporations, the main trade unions, the trade union congress, and so on, and uh, senior cabinet officials. I mean, when when uh, when I spoke in the Iraq War debate, it was right after the the last previous defense secretary and uh and uh, prior to him the last previous chief of the defense staff field marshal brammer and um and uh, the the way it works is it, it's very fair the the uh 
leaders of the parties in the House of Lords determine an issue to be debated. And if people in their groups want an issue debated, there's support for it, they do that. So they meet and they agree, all right, we'll give this, make it a, say, a 12 hour debate uh, over several days. And then uh, whoever, whoever leads and closes for each party, they, they're fixed and they, within reason, can speak for as long as they want. The rest of the time is divided up equally between all of those who signed their desire to speak, which is put in a public place. I mean, public to the people who have a, any business being in the, in the Palace of Westminster, not out in the street, but, you know, anyone who wants, you know, any peer going by, right? I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that, he puts his name up. And, and then it's divided up equal allocation of time. There's a, a clock on all of the four walls. The Lord Chancellor presides. <laughs> And you can see your time, and 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 you don't go over your time. There are no rude interruptions. None of that awful name calling and barnyard imitations you get in the House of Commons and things. Very polite, and um, and 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 you sit down when you're finished. And and, and if you don't, uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, there's a sort of an, a clerk of Lord Chancellor stands up, and at that point you, you really have to say, and and, and everyone does. And, and then when the debate ends, everyone goes to the peers bar and it continues. But, but on a serious subject, you get absolutely brilliant speakers. And, 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 uh, and it's, it's just extremely well done. Very what, what's the net effect on, on British policy? It varies. I mean, sometimes the government needs it. And there are always some members of the government who sit in the House of Lords, so frequently the Attorney General, for example because they always want an extremely respected barrister as the attorney general of the country. And, and that person is likely not an MP. So you put him in as Lords and that's where he serves for. Um, and, uh, but as a matter of fact, as the, as the business of the country unfolds, generally speaking, the influence isn't great. I mean, they may add an amendment here or there, but these are technical matters. But the times arise when, because there are no whips and there is no discipline, I mean, people vote how they want to vote, uh, the, their, the, their, the position of the House of Lords can be very important. Then all of a sudden, all of, you know, when I was there, and I expect to get back to this one of these days, uh, you know, all of a sudden your phone's ringing and you're from, you know, a some prominent figure in the government you haven't heard from for the last five years, you know, they need your vote. And how, are the debates made available to the public in any form other than print yes, form? Yes, no, no, they're on television, as the no. Commons ones are. I and, should and know of that. course, they're, they're also recorded and available to anyone who wants them, you know, in written form. So, all right, so does your, your empire, your media empire at this point, is it, does it reach its peak with your acquisition of the Telegraph? Are you growing no, past No, no, we that? went on after that. We bought the Chicago Sun-Times. Uh, we bought the Fairfax papers in Australia, very distinguished papers. And then we bought the Southam papers in Canada in 1996 and founded the National Post a little after that. And uh, so we, at that point, it was right in there. It was when it was at its height. I mean, and, and it, it was a big company. It was, I mean, in that industry, it wasn't a big company compared to uh, Microsoft or something, but it was a big company in that industry. So, what's happening to your relationship with Canada while you're in while you're in Britain? Well, I came back often, and I kept my house and office here, so I, I kept it up well. You know, I mean, I come back a lot and spend the, practically the whole summer here. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, it wasn't as if I was absent altogether by any means. And then, you know, when we had all the papers here and I'd see the papers, I'd be talking to my associates in one business and another here all the time. I was in the United States a lot, and, uh, uh, you know, our headquarters was in New York. So I was moving around a lot, you know, and I had and home you, in different cities. Right. Are, and are you pleased with the way things are going at this point in your life? Uh, yeah, I am now. It was, it was a very difficult patch and uh, and it was it, it was very difficult but uh, uh yes now i'm i'm am pleased with how things are going i have been for for some years yeah you know, well sorry I, I i wasn't i wasn't clear i when 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 you're in your your the stage of expansion that you just described uh yes yes 
Although I started, I started to have real misgivings about the future of the newspaper business, and and they were well-founded misgivings. But we had a an exit strategy that was being um, conducted very successfully until, as you said in your intro, the, those problems arose. Shall we talk about that a little bit? Okay. So, what happened? You you hit a peak. You you had you were running this in, incredibly influential company. And trouble started to brew. Why? And, and what do you see when you look back? Well, I, I took a good look at the internet. And I just did not see how newspapers could continue as a growth industry. And so, although it, it was painful. And this me, was when? Uh, starting in the, let me see now, starting, we're really at, uh, in the, starting in the, er, about the early 90s, around 93. And so we, we sold Australia at a very handsome profit and had it arranged in a way where it came through with no capital gain assessment on it. That was a company we bought basically out of bankruptcy, not because it wasn't a good company, it just been over levered financially. So the, it was a financial problem rather than an operational one. And, um, and then, and then, uh, I, I, where it really, where it really turned was with um, when I, I sold most of the Canadian newspapers to Izzy Asper, Israel Asper, who who uh, owned the Global Television Network, and um, and 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 we were continuing to do that. We were rolling these papers out. And the idea is we keep the Telegraph. And basically, and, and some of the smaller ones in the U.S. that were particularly profitable. If you've seen the movie Groundhog Day, uh, Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, we own that paper. It, 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 50% of its total revenues were pre-tax profit. It was a very rich paper. Uh, not a big paper, but very profitable. And um, uh, and that's where we were proceeding when, when the legal problems arose. I, I mean, we were going to distribute the money, not as dividends, but buying in and canceling shares out of, you know, at a, at a, in a way that was voluntary. People wouldn't be, you know, they would tender their shares to us because our, our, our offer would be good. And um, so we would compact the company and keep some cash and reposition it in different businesses. But before we got into the implementation of, of the expensive part of that, uh, these legal problems arose, and then, then the whole thing moved sideways and downwards after that. What did you see on the horizon for newspapers that made you uh, nervous about the continued viability of the business? I just didn't see how we could hold the readers against the internet, that the incursions of the internet would be... Irresistible. So, yeah, it, 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 we just didn't ultimately have a defense against it. Mm -hmm. and, and we we tried various things you know we ran we you know we put up internet sites but they were really just um uh enticements to come into the physical paper and essentially that was the problem with the newspaper industry's response it it it, it, it put things on on the internet but unless you just give your content away free in which case you're eventually going to go bankrupt uh you're really in trying to entice people to to buy your product and pay for the huge physical plants that print the papers and the vast networks that distribute them. And that was the problem. The internet had no cost of newsprint and no cost of delivery. Yeah, well, and it's an, also an incredibly effective place to advertise. And um, so, uh, you know, I mean, my prognosis was right and my remedy was right. The, the, uh, uh, there were problems, but they weren't problems created by me. And what, what caused the legal problems? Well, we're getting into a real jungle here, but yeah, essentially what happened was that um, some activist shareholders who were essentially in the green mail business, they would, they would buy into a company where they saw that ultimately the value of it could be greater and then agitate for sale. So they would start stirring up shareholders and uh, creating scenes at the shareholders meetings and things like this. Well, I never had any problem with the shareholders meetings and I right to the end I never had the slightest problem winning any vote at those meetings but um, uh, what what they did was they exploited an American provision of the 
Securities and Exchange Act as, as amended that enabled them to set up a special committee to review what they were complaining about, which was that some of these people, when they bought assets from us, uh, paid a, a non-compete fee to my associates and myself personally. And this, was, this is done in that business. And for example, in Canada, uh, when we sold to Izzy Asper, at the same time, the Sun papers were for sale because I believe McLean Hunter had a cross media problem where they, they couldn't own the television, the cable and the newspaper in the same city. So you had papers coming up for sale in Calgary and Edmonton and uh, Ottawa where, where, where we had papers. So Asper wanted a non-compete from us, you say, we wouldn't then take his money and go and buy another paper, hire everyone away from the place we just left and, and, and compete with them. So it, that was a reasonable thing to do. <clears throat> but anyway, we had people who complained and said it shouldn't go to us. And now in the case of Asper, that didn't go anywhere because he wrote me a letter saying that, 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 he, that he wanted this and he wanted it from us. And there was no ambiguity about that. But some of the cases in the US were more ambiguous, but we, we could have managed all of that. But once it got going, the, um, uh, the special committee and its counsel discovered that an associate of mine had done some naughty things. And in the American manner, having done the naughty things, he said, all right, look, I will give evidence against Mr. Black. Never mind that Mr. Black had not done any naughty things. I'll give evidence against him if you will give me this deal. He's saying mean, this was done through counsel. And it's, you know, the plea bargain system is completely uh, undermined the entire functioning of the criminal justice system. You know, so this was done. And so the, the next thing I knew, we were, we were all being charged with things we didn't do and have ultimately been found not to have done. But meanwhile, I you know, took uh, 15 years of my life to get rid of it all and the asset was destroyed. Everything we'd all worked 30 years to build was reduced to nothing, to bankruptcy. You know, and uh, it, which incidentally meant that uh, more than one and a half billion dollars of shareholder value in the hands of people other than ourselves just evaporated. That was the singular and supreme triumph of the, of the, um, you know, the shareholder governance movement. It was a complete fraud. It was just a bunch of self-righteous hypocrites taking fees for themselves and ruining companies. How did you, how did you survive it? What enabled you to stay? Well, I knew well, that to stay I functional was, enough to serve as a tutor, for example. <laughs> well, I, I, no, I, I knew that I had not, in fact, broken the law, so I was fighting the good fight of the of the wrongfully accused. I was, and I mean, I'm not innocent as a person, but in terms of the criminal statutes of the United States, I was certainly innocent. So I, was, so I had the moral righteousness to fight, and I had the historic knowledge that the alternative to fighting was to be just absolutely eliminated in every respect except physically and conceivably in that way too if i just lost heart altogether i'd lose the will to live so you have to fight you just have no you know it's the cornered it's the cornered animal you have to fight or you're going to be you know uh, wiped out and um and then and then um, in, in the area i think you're getting at uh, it, it, maintenance of morale it, you know it was very difficult at times but um, I am of that view that believes that essentially life is a privilege and, and that you make the most of it, however bad it is. And, and unless you're you know, terminally ill and at death's door, you can always derive some satisfaction from the privilege of life, even if it's just going outside, breathing the fresh air and looking at a blue sky it's, and seeing, you know, leafy trees moving around in the breeze. It's still... It's wonderful when you compare it to nothing, which is the alternative. And, um, and so there is a duty to carry on and, and both my experience individually and as an observer and such uh, acquaintances I have with history shows that fortunes change. And if you, if, you, you know, if you can persevere long enough, you come through things and live to fight another day. So, I mean, it sounds and pretty you, and, humdrum. And, 
No, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say so. N not when it's not when it's acted out in reality. And you said that you're you're satisfied with your life at the moment. That it's it's full and it's rich and. Oh, it's good now. It's good now. I know. Look, I'm 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 uh, I'm following Napoleon's advice to regain lost territory in the inverse order of their loss. So I'm I'm sort of bootstrapping myself up in one way and another. But you know, I look. I have a new. I, I have a new. Um, perspective now that I would not have had and I, I look I'm not saying I, I'm glad I went through all I did but it had its it had its rewards and its rich experiences including the ones you mentioned about the uh, the prison uh, but um, I would never have had the prominence as a commentator that I do I have millions and millions of readers in the United States and and and, uh, and, and I'm astounded at how many people read my stuff and uh, you know, and I get invitations to speak and go on tours and things, and go out and you know, when we're not hobbled by a pandemic, go out and cruises in the Mediterranean and talk to people on the cruise ships and things. And uh, and and I, it's also uh, uh, you know, when I when I when I when this came upon me, I'd written two books, the Duplessis one, and then one about myself, which was really just to deal with accounts. Of my career that uh, that I considered not to be accurate. I was just setting the records straight. I didn't think they were malicious. I just didn't think they were very informative. So that's why I did it. But I, I'd written two books only, and, and as you kindly mentioned, the outset, I've written eight since then. And they've they've all been from modestly to very successful, and 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 I like being a writer. And I wouldn't. I absolutely would not have had the time to do it if I'd had to uh, be a functioning chief executive of a two billion dollar a year sales company i mean it, it is a it is a full-time job and you've got to do it right so when you when you look back what do you think you did right if you're I, there's lots of people who are watching this interview who are trying to put their lives together in one way or another and looking for guidance in in their attempts to do that what what is it that you've done or what is it that you've seen other people do that you admired and that were successful that were was particularly was particularly productive and useful and meaningful, let's say, and maybe even right. Well, I, I think people who do what they have an aptitude to do are, are much happier than that. Unfortunately, a very large number of people who are stuck in occupations they don't like. Uh, uh, so I, it's been my good fortune that um, either I was able to do what I wanted to do and and had some aptitude to do. I was able to make that choice, or I, I, I lucked into it. I didn't realize. I had absolutely no idea that I had an aptitude for it, but as it turned out, I did. You say, I mean, I. It's it's like anything else, I guess. I had always assumed that practically anybody who wrote a book of history really knew a lot about it, uh, was a competent writer, and did a good job. Well, now that I've done some of them. I mean, as, uh, I, as you said, I wrote a book about uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt. There's a vast literature about Roosevelt. And, and some of the people who've written about him have been very good. But a lot of them, it's rubbish. Absolute rubbish. It's not well written. And it's not accurate. And they miss a lot of things. It's even more so the case with Mr. Nixon. He was so terribly controversial. And... Um, uh, and, and indeed, the reason I wrote about those two men was to fill a gap. I never write where I think I have nothing new to add. Uh, I felt that Roosevelt was divided between worshippers and the, these people uttering this nonsense about him being a communist and a traitor to his class who gave Eastern Europe away to Stalin and all this kind of nonsense. And, and, and the thing to do was to, was to put it out. He was neither a saintly man nor a communist. He was extremely important and capable and talented political leader and leader of a government, but, but for, for the reasons I enumerated, not, not out of Kant and emotionalism. And it, it, with Mr. Nixon, I mean, he was, he, he was just pilloried as a, essentially a man with a cloven feet and horns on his head, you know, and, and he wasn't, he was a very good president. And, um, and there, by the way, there's still no probative evidence that he committed a crime. As he admitted himself, he made some serious mistakes. And certainly some of the people in his entourage committed crimes. But there's no evidence that he did. And, and, and this, the one term that he served, 
was one of the most successful in the history of the country. If you, if you take into account that when he came in, there were 550,000 American draftees at the ends of the earth with no exit plan, 200 to 400 coming back dead every week, no relations with China, uh, no arms control talks, riots everywhere in the US every week, all over the place. He stopped all that. He was very, very good president. Anyway, um, so I, I, it was reassuring to me that I could actually do that because I'd always assumed before that the people who did it, did it adequately. Well, some of them do, but a lot of them don't. And there, there's always room for improvement or almost always. And um, uh, so I, so I, you know, gradually my horizons expanded, and now I'm in finance and rebuilding my fortunes somewhat. But the exact opposite to how I began in in business, where I mean, as far as anyone in the public would know, where because I took over a company that was made famous by very famous businessmen, E.P. Taylor and Bud McDougall in particular, I was in the public eye all the time. And, and as a young man, it's naturally going to be irritating to a lot of people. Well, now I'm not. I mean, I am up to a point, but as a commentator, but no one has a clue what business is in. They are private and they're in different countries and, and they're no, you know, no one knows. And, and so I, I don't have that problem of, of sort of wrestling with a public relations monster all the time. And... Um, uh, yeah, you, I think I, you mentioned in one of the books that I read that you in retrospect, wish that you would have handled the public relations end of things, I suppose, in a more sophisticated manner or earlier, that you didn't realize how critically important it might be. Is that, am I recalling that accurately? Is that a fair uh, summation? Uh, 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 with, uh, substantially so, yes. But uh, my, uh, my, my view was there's no way to avoid a lot of attention. So what I should do is meet it head on and at least uh, cause to be discarded the caricature that all business people are fundamentally stumble bums of self-expression. I can't actually give a fluent explanation of what I'm doing. And secondly, to advance the idea that business is in fact, not just a bunch of grubby businessmen scruffing for cash. It, it actually is an interesting subject. And I thought, I, I thought those were, correct premises and I was successful at that but 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 where what you said is exactly right is I didn't I didn't appreciate as much as I sh perhaps should have or would have if I were more experienced uh, how tired people can get of someone who doesn't have a natural call in their attention I think this incidentally was one of the chief problems of the immediate former president of the US. He, he always believed, and I, I've known him a long time, he always believed that there was no such thing as bad publicity, no matter how apparently negative it was. Well, up to a point he was right, but not it, it wasn't right once he became president, because once he got to the, be the, in Roosevelt's phrase, the head of the American people, he didn't need the publicity and he didn't, he didn't want it and was undignified for him to be seeking it, let alone for him to tolerate so much of it, to be baiting sessions where his, where his enemies challenged him and he responded. I mean, he had reached a position where you can safely rise above most of that and just spoke when you have some, speak when you have something to say. Um, I, in my book about Roosevelt, there's a little piece in a letter he sent to um, someone who had been a colleague of his in the Wilson administration, where he was saying how, how a president has to know when to be in front of the public and when not, and when it will irritate the public and when not. Well, I, I, I wish I had, obviously I never had a position of 1% of the consequence of being president of the US, but I, I wish I had taken that on board even at the modest scale of where I was, um, you know, before I embarked on this. But, but you know, part of, part of uh, surviving and growing older is you learn things. I think perhaps that's a good place to stop. Okay. Well, I, I've kept you too long. I hope uh, I hope uh, either people find some of it interesting, or if not, they should put it on when when they're afraid they may be suffering from insomnia. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, thank you 
extremely for for talking with me today and for no always a pleasure always a pleasure jordan i appreciate it very much and 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 i hope we get to do it again there's many things that we didn't talk about i i didn't talk about any of your opinions about current about current affairs or 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 about the future or many things that i would have liked to have discussed but no, we, we can do it another time jordan great Thank you.